Welcome so to the rolling. Elite FTS Table Talk Podcast with your host, Dave Tate. Now we're rolling. All right, did you want to start with what we have here or go with one of the YouTube things? <laughs> I'd say with over there because there's not people tuning just yet. No, I mean the ones that you had posted. Oh. Because uh, you, post, you posted Holy a shit. Q&A thing. From uh, on, the, on the YouTube community? Yeah. Yeah, let me, let me pull that up here. Yeah. <clears throat> Because I didn't even really look at these, man. I just kind of skimmed through here. Uh, Did you watch Transformer? Transformer? Yes, I watched Transformer. <clears throat> not, not the Transformers. Yeah, the, the Croc thing. <laughs> I did not watch it. Any good? All right. Good times, Dave. I haven't watched it No, yet. the only reason I'm pausing with it is I mean, we've, known, we've known Croc for forever after this we'll talk about abortion okay yeah yeah we've known croc for 15 <laughs> years or something and you know i thought i knew everything about and there really wasn't anything in there i don't think that you'll see that we didn't already know yeah it's it's just the way that the story was told and i i don't mean to slam on the actually i am slamming on the people that put the story together they could have done a better job it was it was not a good story He's got a lot of story, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. I, I, he, she, whatever he wants to be called, she wants to be called for that time being. But it just it didn't have a very good flow to it. It was all over the place. It was un- edited poorly. Yeah, I, I don't uh, – I feel like I already know Matt, <clears throat> Matt's story. Uh, I don't know if that's what I – you know. But uh, I, don't know, I felt like I was kind of like a voyeur. I don't want to – <laughs> I mean, it's his life is his life. I just, I don't know if that makes sense. I'm like, I kind of know his story. I'm happy for him. I don't really, I don't need to be paraded around, uh, you know, so. The one thing I didn't know is the, I knew he had a lot, he, he had a lot invested into it as far as financially. Oh, don't. You know, I had no idea how much <laughs> that really was. Should have asked him for a loan. You know, where it's like, holy <laughs> shit, dude. Um, but as long as, you know, as long as he's, she's, I mean, that's the only weird thing with it is all I know. I don't, I don't know what pronoun to use because I do, if he sends me or she sends me a text because yeah, yeah. I know who it's coming from. Otherwise I just say croc. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> I have a very simple rule. I don't trust anyone who tells me what words I can and cannot say. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, what's that? Yeah, I just I think that's authoritarian and fucking asshole this and you don't get to tell me. I don't yeah. care what word it is, just like uh you don't tell me what I can and can't do with my business or my life. So uh it doesn't mean there's no maliciousness on my part. No, I just no. I've known Matt longer than I've known Janae. So I just he's Matt to me and and uh you know, it's not like I disrespect it at all. I I think he's an awesome dude and girl, whatever. I don't know what to see. I don't know what to fucking do, but you know. I, think, I think you were the first person out of all of us that he let know. Yeah. Besides his training partners, it was a, it was a, uh, a kick in the face a little bit. I didn't, cause I didn't know anything about it. You know, it wasn't like it is today where everyone's talking about this and that. So I don't know. I didn't really care. I was like, all right, you know, this is, that's a crazy thing. Can you fucking was, roll good? Exactly. I mean, it <laughs> I was, care. And my dates get all fogged up because I'm old now, but it's the funny thing is it, it, it had to have been six, eight years, 10 years before that time, you know, of him kind of letting everybody know and his training partners already know him beforehand. Yeah. And then it kind of breaking loose. And for like a decade, we, we all don't give a fuck. No, no. We already uh, like, oh, that's weird. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Have fun. You know, see you later. We're going yeah. out to dinner here. You're going there. That's cool. You know, we'll catch you in the morning for bench. It's, not, you know, it was not a big deal. And no. then all of a sudden it was like this big fucking deal. And it's, it was weird for us because we're like, why is this such a big deal? It's, yeah. Should we have thought it was? You know, it's just, it's, it's kind of fucked up the way that kind of all played out. But I remember he came up to me at the pro am and said something. Yeah. That was the, the one. I, yeah, and he's all concerned about yeah. his sponsorship. I'm like, well, I mean, are you going to, like, whack it off? Or, I mean, what are you going to do? Well, at this point, I don't know. I'm like, well, then there's nothing to be concerned about because no. you're not going to be, you know, entering a different division that you're not in and just do whatever makes you happy. And it was just – it was an interesting 
interesting because I would have thought that the backlash would have been worse then, but nobody gave a shit. But so I guess that you know who your real friends are. Yes. You know, yes. so then you know who you can really count on from the from the early on. Um, not sure how we got on that from the first question, but that's coming out coming out of the gate with a bang. <laughs> but um and he was he was all for it. I mean when it when it broke and it broke on interesting enough, it broke on outlaws and it was I, I don't remember that. That, yet, that powerlifting forum yeah. before there was really social media. And I was on vacation at the time, and I started getting text after text after text. I'm like, oh, shit. I'm on vacation, motherfucker. Yeah. So <laughs> I call Croc, and I'm like, dude, do you know what's going on right now? And, you know, we talked for a little bit. And I'm like, look, if you're cool with this, if your kids are cool with this, let it roll. You know, just be careful what the media is going to do. And he kind of had a, a, a plan. He, he wasn't ready for when it came out, but he knew it was going to eventually yeah. come out. And by that time, he'd been telling his kids since they were eight ten years old yeah so that wasn't that was the biggest concern when he used to speak to us is he didn't want his, his kids, kids cats and shit yeah, at the school and stuff like that yeah, yeah. And, and junior high and stuff like that now they're in high school and probably can whip everybody's ass so they ain't gonna say anything yeah. to them yeah all right i got a couple here for jim it was uh, a couple that are tied in with you coaching high school kids uh okay biggest lessons learned from the kids you've coached that you've applied to your own lifting slash life and then uh, just what have you learned about yourself? The biggest lessons I learned from that. <laughs> that, that. That you've applied to your own lifting. So, I mean, just the biggest lessons you've learned. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things, uh, you know, Dave always talked about having uh, the principles of his business. Or what are they called, Dave? Values. Values. <laughs> okay, and then. So, uh you know, one of the things I had going for me early on was the, uh, you know, I had played football, I had lifted weights, but I think uh, one of the things I try to continue now is, you know, <clears throat> if you're going to put athletes through hard workouts and all this different stuff, I s still think you need to do that yourself a little bit so you have some perspective on what they're feeling. And uh, you can push the, uh, when you're pushing yourself pretty hard, you can, empathize with them a little bit um i think that's the the biggest thing that <clears throat> i keep things in perspective for myself the other thing i believe that uh is the art of patience um and understanding that this is not a quick fix um you know being involved here for so long and going to seminars for the most part we dealt with people who knew what was going on uh, but most of the kids there don't. And so you have to execute some patience. And you have to understand this is a four-and-a-half-year plan for most of these kids, and you have to take it as such. And I go back to something I <clears throat> remember Buddy Moore is saying is, you know, do you have any up-and-coming advice for any up-and-coming strength coaches? And I said, and he said, uh, learn how to – don't worry about the programming first. Worry about teaching the people movements. And that's all I worry about. I don't worry about the load on the bar. I worry about the execution of the movement before we do anything. So – you know, if, if anything, it's brought me back to when I first started training. And you realize uh, <clears throat> all the advanced stuff that we did and all this different shit we did, you know, it's really not applicable <laughs> to anything. And it's, that's just the way it goes. Um, you just have to be better at being a good beginner coach. And, uh, you know, the other thing is from a broader perspective – and uh, I think Dave can understand this is I think for any man alive, you got to have some kind of purpose in your life. And, you know, <clears throat> besides your family, I think you have to have a broader purpose, some, some kind, something of your work. And, you know, how many years did I answer questions and do seminars and stuff? And you feel like you're doing good. And then you go to a high school and you see the whole community transform. And now I feel like I'm really making a, a bigger difference at a smaller level, but it's significant. So, did you expect to make that much of a difference that quick? Well, I, I I always tell people, and we've heard this a million times. You know, especially with head coaches or quarterbacks or strength coaches, you get a lot more credit than you deserve when they, things go right, and you take a lot of shit when things go wrong. Right? I mean, you you know, and at at some point. <clears throat> 
if I, I always tell the kids, listen, I'm not out there getting concussions. I'm not there putting my body on the line. You guys do all the work. I'm just kind of pushing you in the right direction. But uh, so I, I, I don't want to, you know, and the head coach puts in so much time. The amount of work that a high school coach goes into, I had no idea. Uh, we know like Nick Saban is always at the office kind of bullshit. But, in a, you know, he's also getting paid money. It's a high profile job. But, you know, you're a high school coach no matter where you are in this country you know, with the exception of maybe some places in California and Texas, New Jersey, and some places of Ohio, it's, you really love your job. You're not getting paid uh, enough for, you know, per hour. So, uh, but I had no idea after one full off season, it just completely changed. You know, we, our team went from being not very good to absolute domination. And, uh, you know, it's funny <clears throat> how many times that Dave and I would go to these schools and stuff and we'd see record boards and stuff like that and we would kind of laugh because it's like you know squatting six seven hundred pounds and now i realize it doesn't fucking matter what they lift as long as they get a little better because i'm <clears throat> we're not, we're, i'm not getting you know it's not like i'm alabama or ohio state where you get top level athletes and stuff but even then they're not top level lifters dave they're top level defensive ends if that at the yeah. high school level they're not even that no at the high school i'm saying at ohio yeah. state oh okay yes you yes, know there's yes. so even so all i care about is the kids get a little bit better every day you know we just try to get a little bit better and uh you know i just you watch the kids uh and i don't, you know i guess mature is one way but <clears throat> and i think this has a lot to do with the head coaches uh the kids want to do things right it's not one of those when you turn your back, the seniors are out fucking around. They're over there leading, getting on people and stuff. So the kids, you know, just like every, like when you're, your kids, you know, <clears throat> as a parent, they want discipline, they want direction. And these kids did too. And it's not like I have to stay on these kids at all, but that's the direct result of the head coach kicking ass, not me. I'm just part of the one small part, co uh, you know, cog in the machine though. So I think there's a few avenues to kind of spin off on this that I'm kind of interested to bring to the listeners and the first being because I don't want to forget it not being a significant but definitely being significant is for years you were motivating and helping people break PRs on a micro or on a macro level yeah on a digital level the elite FTS Q&A yeah. you know millions of questions if not yeah. more you know than the articles and the seminars and the thing with the digital world, more so now than back when we were doing it, you really didn't know what you were really doing. No. Unless we had a seminar. No. <laughs> you know, you, then you had a seminar and people were like, man, that one thing that you wrote really helped me out. So you live in this kind of vacuum world where you think that you're helping people and you hope you're helping people, but you really don't know. Well, you, you send a question off. It just goes off in the ether. You're yeah. Like, Later. So, yeah, you don't know. <laughs> I hope this works. <laughs> But it's being absorbed. So it's really hard for coaches or people in that sphere to self actualize to a level that I believe could be considered purpose. Like yeah, that's what, that's what I'm about. saying. I, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't have any day to day contact. You know, like that's the one thing with seminars that was tough is we would do the hands on shit. And then it was, that was it. But yes. you know, <clears throat> the hands-on stuff, it takes eight weeks. Yes. Maybe even longer. I mean, who, I'm just making mm -hmm. up a number. And it's great that, you know, we fix someone's squat, but, you know, come Monday, do they even remember that? Yeah. And, you know, it takes, how many times do people yell, sit back and knees out? Oh, it's, how many times I yell that in a, in a training session? <laughs> so it's crazy. And uh, so, yeah, that's, yeah, I, that's the one thing. Now, that, that's what I'm trying to get as I didn't know what I was doing. And yeah, now at a micro level, you do though, because yeah. you're seeing these kids day in and day out, you know, when they walk in the gym yeah. before they even walk three foot, you know, what kind of mood they're in, if they're ready to be pushed, if they're not needing yeah. to be pushed, if you got to pull them aside, see what's wrong. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's 80 per, I've always said it's 80% nonverbal, but yet all <laughs> the experts online believe it's 100% email digital, Yep. which it's, it's really not. Well, you, as a coach, you, uh, that's, that's probably the best way to put it is, you know, <clears throat> with video or, uh, writing and stuff, it's, you know, giving you suggestions, but <clears throat> when they, 
everything that we do is based on their attitude. Mm-hmm. Now we have a general plan, and most of the times the general plan gets administered. But you know, as soon as something goes wrong, everything kind of goes out the window. You can't do that digitally. Right? How many times he's like, when you feel good, work up. And everyone's like, I fucking feel good. I'm like, no, you don't, dude. No, you do don't. That. I saw that set. That set sucked. That's where it, you know, it comes in. And, you know, the other thing is, you know, just I remember we would do seminars and people ask us about coaching. And <clears throat> I remember after like a year or two, we were sitting around talking. He's like, you know what? Some of these coaches need to take some communications uh, or public speaking stuff. And I'm like, holy shit, that's like the number one thing they need to work on is there is developing human relationships and communicating. So it had nothing to do with sets and reps and, and uh, Prilipin's charts. It had to do with actual communication. Now, some people are better at that than others, but we see guys all the time stumbling over everything mm-hmm. when they're coaching. And it was like a weird realization that the number one thing you need as a coach isn't what we thought it was. Actually, it wasn't super the, training. The number, was, yeah. <laughs> the number one thing is to shut up and yeah. learn how to listen. Yeah, you learn, listen and observe and know how to communicate in a way that they that can reach the kids. So Now the other the other road that kind of spun off of this. And you can't write a book on that by the way. No, Not, uh, we've tried. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, the target demographic for Elite FTS has always been people who put training as one of their top four priorities. Well, that's serious lifters, coaches, and yeah. people who earn a living from that. So a lot of our content has always been driven kind of towards coaches. But even with that being said, it still trickles down to um, beginner coaches, coaches who still don't yes. understand, they still don't really listen, or they think that they know more than what they really know. Or, yes. I mean, it's, it's funny that the people that have been around the longest you speak to know the least. You know, and the, the, the ones fresh out of college, five years with a certification, know every fucking answer in the world. And... Um, <laughs> I just, I, I knew I was going to get off the fucking topic. No, no. Oh, the, I know where I wanted to go. When you were speaking about beginners, let, let's, uh, let's validate that a little bit because your beginners, as you were speaking before we got on the mics here, was a little different than even a little bit lower than what I expected. Yeah. So the take a worst case. <clears throat> well, we don't want the worst case. Take an average worst case uh, well, segment. we get a lot of, uh, <clears throat> because of the success of the program, we have a lot of junior high kids coming in now. And uh, occasionally you'll get, you know, we had one kid who came in and deadlifted 300 pounds, but that's the absolute craziness, you know. Uh, but we have kids, uh, they just don't have the coordination and control to jump. Uh, now, if you think about that, like if you, <clears throat> to use both your arms, you know, jump in a coordinated way, uh, can't land on two feet and land what we call landing strong. Um, so you're talking not when people think beginner, we thought, you know, they squat 200 pounds, but and the reality is that to me is like, you're doing pretty good. Uh, these beginners, some of them can't, uh, can't hold an arch in their back. Don't even know what it, you know, to do this. Like you have to physically kind of put your you know hand in the back kind of thing. So uh, my beginner, and I didn't realize this, it was is very much, and I'm sure every other coach goes through this in the high school level, is not what everyone else thinks is a beginner. And uh, the hardest thing is, <clears throat> well, the, the good thing is you can only get better. And the hard thing is like, well, what do I do to get them better? And the thing is you just keep pounding away the stupid shit that we've done for years. You know, you have them do body weight squats you have them you know uh we have them push the prowler around yeah there's a <clears throat> that's a you know i'm promoting the prowler right that's yeah, yeah that's a good thing <laughs> i'm cool with that uh but even like uh <clears throat> i'll give you an example we had a kid who couldn't hold his you know the back position on a trap bar deadlift with the high handles and uh it took six weeks of twice a week and all this, and so instead of doing all these weird supplemental exercises, I'm just like, dude, we're gonna, you're gonna learn and strengthen your back. So this way, and, and all of a sudden it just clicked, and he's able to hold his back position. So now we can load the bar a little bit. Um, but I, I don't. <clears throat> I guess it's it was this was the hardest thing for me to to uh, to work with. Besides, you got 60 kids, and there's one coach. That's when it starts getting hard, 
is when you got a kid down there squatting 400 pounds for reps coming out of the hole like a madman and then you got a kid who can't body weight squat and you're trying to manage all this uh it's very difficult that's where the real art of coaching comes in and people can talk about science all they want dave but you have to you know we talk about communication and stuff like that you have to know how to coach a room imagine 60 people in here from chuck vogelpool down to i don't know an untrained kid and you're like dude manage all these workouts let's go you got an hour <laughs> well you quickly have to become a leader so you can create your own leaders underneath yes you. that's the big thing is what i learned is is and what i did when i first my first year i was there i came in during the season okay and at that time uh i'm not i don't know if how much i can go into this uh without being boring everyone I did handle all the training for the entire team. However, with the varsity, it gets a little hairy because I didn't know what they did during the off season. So what you do in the in season is entirely dependent. What you do in the in season is entirely dependent on what you do in the off season. So if you do lunges and all that shit, you can, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <clears throat> so what I did was I took the JV. I still handled the varsity, but I just watched the volume and stuff like that. With the JV, I said, listen, we're going to train right through. By the time the off season comes around, you guys are going to be good to go. So we started very basic. I taught them how to, uh, you know, <clears throat> dumbbell squat and body weight squat, and we did push-ups. We did that for six weeks. Uh, so by the time the season was over, I had got them going 100% the way I wanted to, and I was able to let them go a little bit, and then I was able to bring the varsity in and show this is how we're going to train. Uh, so then now that everyone's on the same page, now I can let the varsity go a little bit, and I can handle the younger kids who come in. The problem that... <clears throat> that presents though is the varsity still needs to be pushed and they still need some direction. So that's where I'm starting to, that's my biggest issue right now. So I spent about 25 minutes with the young kids first. And uh, the good thing is the varsity, if I turn my back, nothing happens. If you turn your back on the young kids, <laughs> whatever you think a squat used to be <laughs> has, been, <laughs> has been redefined in ways you can't fucking imagine. <laughs> It's like a Picasso painting, and so uh, <laughs> I'm not joking. It's like, uh, holy fuck. Oh, you should hear the things that come out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, that's where it starts getting crazy. So I find, you, know, you have to find a way to get them doing something that's not going to hurt them in such a way that when you turn your back. But uh, we've been doing a lot of different stuff lately. In fact, right now we are... <clears throat> We are in better shape and physically healthier than we've ever been, even probably prior to a season. We're so far ahead of everyone. And what's even more interesting is we take one week off a year, okay? We take the week off after the season. So we train 51 weeks out of the year. To give you some perspective, it's spring break now in London. We had everyone show up except for a few kids who are on vacation. Everyone show up Monday at 9.30 in the morning. Christmas Eve, the whole team showed up. Christmas Eve, Dave. Everyone's there, and they voted on that. Mm -hmm. we, we said, you guys want the day off? We'll give it to you. You know, we'll find a way around it. So what that allows me is <clears throat> instead of, like, uh, cramming for a test, like let's say we had eight weeks to get ready, then you're fucked, right? Yeah. Everyone's yeah. sore. Everyone's tired. Like, what do we do? Do we train? How do we train? When you have 51 weeks, we just train, and kids come home, go home, and they're, they're not tired. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know how easy that is to train kids when they don't have to beat the fuck out of them? And they can come in day after day after day, and they're fine. So, but again, that has to do with the head coach, not me. Uh, I just was smart enough to realize you can't, 51 weeks of training, you can't beat the shit out of people. No. Uh, and I, I did a video on my Instagram page. This is the first time I did a, like a spoken video because I was so upset. For about two weeks, I watched uh, videos on YouTube, like strength hype videos from colleges oh, and high schools. Oh, it's that time, yeah. So I'm watching them, and there's, it's you know, from all different uh, colleges and high schools, and they're from five years ago, you know, all the way up until fairly recent. And their big thing is grinding. We gotta grind, we gotta work. And I was like, man, we don't do any of that shit. <laughs> we do none of that. And you know, these elaborate conditioning drills where the kids are puking, I'm like, man, we don't, like we literally do nothing like that. We just work. Like our running is fairly easy. Our kids are never puking. I mean, maybe the kid who's severely out of shape, but that's, that's good. That's yeah, good well, thing. it's just, you know, yeah. you have to have some expect expectations. But for the most part, we run, and the kids are like, man, eh, that's it, you know. 
But you can do that if you do that 51 weeks out of the year. We don't even condition during the season. We're in such good shape. And, uh, but that, that's a whole other thing. But uh, where is I? Well, I think, I think another thing that kind of comes into that, and this is just me being. Grind! Yeah, it's, 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 it's me being outside of the sphere. I'm outside of the bubble. Like you're in the bubble, like you're living in that bubble. I'm in a whole nother fucking bubble is a lot of coaches and a lot of people that would criticize high school coaches or even college coaches to a certain degree, lower level college coaches. They don't understand that you have a a four year attrition rate. Yeah. In high school, that's that would be good, but it's probably average. College is probably less. It's probably two and a half year attrition yeah, rate at the big bigger schools. Yeah. Yeah. So your your training is it's going to be basic because if any strength coach, personal trainer, on whatever you want to call yourself out there, if you got somebody that came in that never lifted weights before in their life, what are you going to have them do the first three years? Yep. Well, that's why I tell people it doesn't matter. <clears throat> For example, uh, if you're Dave Tate, All American D end, you're an All American great the end you're not an all-american lifter you're a shit lifter Mm -hmm. so you don't really need to do anything that fancy that's where i think things get a little fucked up is they see chuck vogel or whoever i'm just making this you know because chuck's pictures up there he's using all these fancy things that's because chuck's an advanced lifter if you take chuck out to the football field you're going to tell him teach him how to get in a stance Mm -hmm. for the first 12 weeks (laughs) and show him how to fire out that's it so and i'll never forget the the uh <clears throat> well, this doesn't have – I'm just going to tell this Louie story that you told me one time about. Uh, Louie was talking to a basketball coach, and they didn't want to – he's like, you know, the kids don't really want to lift. And Louie's like, that's fucking crazy, you know, lifting weights to make you better. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of weeks go by or something, and Dave's like, hey, maybe we should, we should uh, outside the gym, we'll put up a basketball hoop, you know. And <laughs> Louie's like, wow, that's fucking stupid. He's like, well, now you know how basketball players feel about lifting. <laughs> and uh, – that was just me being a dick. Yeah, I know, but it's fucking, it's a great point. <laughs> it's a great point. And that's the other thing I think people need to understand is, uh, as a coach, no one in that weight room is going to care more about training than you. They don't care. I mean, they care, and most of the kids do care. But they're not going to go home and research and spend all time. They're going to go out and do whatever the fuck they want. And that's, that's you know, I always tell if if they cared about training, you wouldn't have a job, dude, so just relax. And... Uh, but <clears throat> I don't know. To, f- to fall back on it a little bit, and this would be the, the most optimal situation, the kid trains under you for four years, then he goes to a D1 school, and then that coach gets him with four years of solid base training. Yes. And then perhaps, I'm, I'm using that term very loosely because I've seen the same videos. I'm going to say it again, very loosely. Perhaps that kid threw a full off season, a couple other eight week. Yeah. The college is weird the way that their yep. the training is broke up. Then yeah, maybe they are at a position conditioning wise to do some to do some crazy shit like that after six years of solid base training. And I'm still saying perhaps. Well, the the problem is the way that you remember how we talked to Buddy and Milo, and they're like with all the bullshit that they have to deal with with the unions uh they don't really get the guys at all right for the football now with college it's a little bit different but they have some kind of limitations the problem is is i'll give you an example at the end of this football season it's november december right now me and dave let's say we're playing we're only conditioned to do what we do on the field that's it so generally you're in the you're in the best condition for what you do, but in worse condition otherwise. Mm-hmm. It's like powerlifting. Like, I can walk up to the monolift. I can get through my workouts. But you ask me to go to Disney World, it ain't going to happen. No. So <clears throat> then we take three, four weeks off for Christmas break, and then we come back in January, and what do they have them do? These fucking insane circuits. Uh, morning, they call them uh, morning runs or something. And then so <clears throat> you're asking your guys to do the most conditioning when they're least prepared. Does that make sense? It mm-hmm. doesn't make any sense. No, it makes it. no sense. It's just digging a hole. So now you dig a now you're dug a hole, and now you have spring ball come around. Now you can't really train that much, and then you have some time off for finals. Then you have the off. So you really don't don't get a lot of time. If they were smart, like listen, we're going to build you back up right through spring ball. We're going to train through spring ball with some some sense of common sense, and we'll go right through it until the end of the you know the beginning of the season. But instead, 
it would be great to think that you could take a kid four we, four years of great training, and then we could do that, but they'd fuck it up already. Yeah. And that's not all on the strength coach. That's usually the head coach saying, you know, we want my, want my you know, they believe working hard. Like my, <laughs> the other thing is they all think they're fucking Navy SEALs. Navy SEALs okay. do that for five days a week, five days. Hell week is five, what are they called? Five days, hell week. And they're the toughest motherfuckers in the world, and most of them leave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what makes you think some kid who's on scholarship is going to give you, you know? And, uh, no, granted, they're not doing the same thing the SEALs are doing, but they adopt that weird attitude where it's... Uh... And the other thing you have to understand, too, and I got this from Don James, the great legendary Washington football coach, is <clears throat> we don't... Whatever guys we have, that's who we got to play with. I can't let a, make a kid quit. That's fucking stupid. We don't have, we, especially at London, we don't have enough guys. Everyone on our team plays both ways. I can't afford a kid to quit. I can't, you know, that doesn't mean I don't push the kid, but I'm not here to, you know, ruin his life. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like Dude. the SEALs were like, listen, if Gary fucks up, dude, you're dead. It's like, well, if he fucks up, you know, we'll just teach him again, maybe. <laughs> yeah. To be fair to most of the strength coaches that I know and that you know as well, um, I would probably guess the majority of this is just marketing hype bullshit. It is, they, but I, I mean, also think, like I said, I think it's the head coach yeah. who puts his fucking nose in, and I'll, I'm in a great situation as he doesn't tell me what to do. Like, he'll ask me, and we'll have suggestions, but it's pretty much like, well, okay, I trust you. Yeah. You know, and uh, how many – there's not a lot of coaches that do that. Like, I don't – I don't tell them what fucking defense to run. Yeah. I don't fucking know. <laughs> exactly. The higher yeah. level is going to be less and I'll likely. Tell you, the, the best thing I tell, like, the head coach and I are really good friends. And when I first started the off season, uh, Kyle has his, uh, he did, like, GAs in the weight room and stuff, like his internships and stuff like that. So his, his knowledge base is pretty big of training. And so his, the first couple weeks of the off, my first off season, he was at, like, can we do some of this? Should we do this? And I'm like, yeah, we don't really need to. What about this? And he's like, maybe we should add in some of this. I'm like, dude, don't worry about it. And uh, so finally I walk up the stairs to the weight room, and there's Kyle sitting on the bench. He's got his head in his hands, just looking miserable, miserable. And I'm like, dude, what's wrong? He's like, dude, I just did our workout, what you had the kids do. I'm like, yeah? He's like, I'll never question the fucking thing you said. <laughs> he's like, and he goes, it looks so, you know, the – and the amount of work that we do is surprising. Like we have kids lifting thirty to forty thousand pounds a session. That's a lot of weight, Dave, mm -hmm. for a high school kid. Now we built up to that. Now, not obviously, not everyone does it like that. Uh, every kid, obviously, it's based on their strength level. But the amount of work that we do is absolutely insane. When you know, <clears throat> we again we've built up to it. Uh, and we start off with body uh, dumbbell squats and push-ups. That's how we started. But um, I give. So I think it's important that you have that kind of uh, trust. And you really don't, you know, as, if I was the head football coach, you want, especially at Alabama or Ohio State or LSU, like you're responsible for everything, man. Like if this company goes to shit, guess who? Uh, mm -hmm. Guess. Who? Oh, I know very well. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're digging your own <laughs> fucking grave, dude. Boo. So uh, I get it to a certain extent, but that's kind of why you outsource shit or, uh, you know, delegate there we go. That's well, the yeah, I mean, you got to delegate, outsource, and listen. Yeah. You know, listen to, the, you know, the greatest criticism, as long as it's coming from the right people. Yep. And build a network of people that you can trust, and that's that's a tough one. You yeah. know, especially, I think you got to, I'm, I'm trying to find all these reasons to justify why being old is a good thing. But, <laughs> you know, being older is a good thing because you got, you got people that you've known for 20 years. So you kind of know, yeah, I can trust this guy. I, I'm not too sure about this guy. Yeah. You know, so when it comes to shit that's really fucked up, say you need inner, inner uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Introspection or introspection. In introspection. Introspection. You Something know, like that. Yeah, I got five. Look at it, yeah. look at it inside. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, got, I got people I can go to and say, look, man, be, be real with what, you're what, what you think. Yeah. And that, there's going to be no fucking doubt. I won't like what I'm going to hear. Um, most of the time, but, um, it's what you need to hear, but it's what you need to hear where, you know, a lot of times if you just have buddies that you've been hanging around with for a couple of years, they're going to tell you whatever the fuck you want to hear. That yeah, goes back to the old, uh, you got, you're right at parallel. Then you go to a meet. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You just, you Dude, I heard, uh, there was, a, a the, a geared meet at the Arnold and, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. There's about eight okay. people. All right. So, uh, geared. 
<clears throat> so uh, I, I got lost in the. I couldn't find you know whatever i wandering around someone saw me and i'm like hey how you doing and he's like oh the meat's terrible all the squats are high and i was like fuck yeah like it <laughs> made me feel so happy again. yeah <laughs> back to where it should be baby <laughs> the equilibrium has <laughs> exactly and what's funny is uh towards the end of the geared revolution man my squats and your squats were fucking deep we yes. took them to the hole baby <laughs> now they would be <laughs> Yeah, you know, that, yeah. At, at the time, it's like you do the lift, and you're like, you're holding the bar, you're doing that soft look over your right shoulder, like, oh yes, Whew. got it, you uh, know. Uh, or you know, you 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 got the whole thing going where you miss the first two, and you're like telling your buddy, man, go tell the announcer to let the crowd know I need this one to stay in the meet. Go over by that real easy judge, have him tap. Yeah, have Louie call me up. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's like seven or eight things. There's an article there. Um, <laughs> here's um, a little different question to go in a different direct- direction. Um, I'm going to relate this to athletes, and I can take it more from you know, a company perspective. How to, find, how to fire a client or customer, how to cut negative people, even if it's family members, out of your life. So... Let's say you got an athlete that's not – you can't really fire the – well, I don't know. Talk about that. Well, uh, with the athlete stuff in high school, you got to give them – I believe you have to give the kid every chance, every single chance, uh, because you have a chance to completely turn his life around. Um, I think that's uh, – and I've seen kids uh, and, you know, I had a couple freshmen or so who quit the team and they come back a couple years later. I didn't even know it was the same kid, completely different kid. And uh, at that age, you know, you're dealing with so many outside <clears throat> influences and the kids need to mature. I mean, that's just the way it goes. You're a very young kid. You can't a- apply being alive for 45, 50, 40 years, whatever you are, and ex- expect a 13-year-old kid to, to, mm-hmm. to grasp that. Now, with, like, uh, your everyday life, like, the, you know, your friends and stuff, you walk this weird line because you want to help people, you know, your friends out. But if they, if they're continually digging a hole for themselves and they're trying to drag you in, you got to go. And I just, you know, I don't have, we have what, maybe 70 years on this earth, 70, 80, you know, especially when you start to get big and all this bullshit that we're doing. Um, I just want to spend it with my family with people I love to do and and I don't I'm not a very social person I love my, hanging out with my wife and my kids and uh I just think it's <clears throat> how, the best way to put this is uh I don't want to spend time with uh, doing things that I don't really want to do uh with, and of course you're going to have to you know do the bullshit you got to do your taxes i mean at least in theory you have to do your taxes well you've also earned a position to be able to yeah just to do that to, um, to do what you're saying but at the same time even if uh with a lot of stuff like if you know i i've talked to my son about this my oldest son one of his friends was drinking and stuff i'm like dude fucking let him go because <clears throat> you know trying to help him out i understand that's not your fucking job it's his parents job and all it's, you're going to get associated with him you're gonna, uh, you know, <clears throat> you're gonna be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and that's doing nothing to help you out. And spe- you know, it's funny, like, right? Remember when we were in high school and everything fucking mattered? <laughs> and now it's 2019, like, eh, hey, nothing matters. <laughs> no. Now it mattered at the time. You have to yes. have some perspective. Yes. But uh, you know, it's important that uh, he have he be selfish in his desire to be better. I guess is the best way to say it at that age. I think it's super. Now, when you're a little older with a family, like, you can't be so selfish with it. Um, but, you you know, the way our society works is, you know, he's got a, a small window for college and small window for a lot of this. Now, granted, there's you can always make amends and stuff. But, uh, you know, he wants to play sports in college. And, you know, if his drunk friend fucks him up, then what are you going to do? One, one mistake can one kill mistake. a dream. Yeah, and especially in the, you know, I tell all the kids, listen, I don't know what you guys do on the weekends, but take people's keys and take people's cell phones. Don't record a damn thing because it'll ruin you. You know, you like do one tweet from twenty years ago or whatever. I don't know how long Twitter's been around. Do ruin people. You know, one picture. 
you have one girl who sends some fucking nude photo, you're screwed, dude. So uh, I know this gets a little bit off topic, but uh, I just think at, when you're a young kid and you have a, something you want to do, wh- whatever that is, whether it be sports or whatever, be selfish in your pursuit and, and make sure the people around you, at the very least, don't take something away from you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and that's a mature thing to do. Uh, it really is. Um, so, I, you know, me personally, I was so driven and such a kind of an asshole with my selfishness, as most men are, that it never really occurred to me um, to get driven in another direction. Because I'm like, I, I just, this is what I want. So, Jay Allen and I had a conversation about that because it's, it was something that popped in my head a couple of weeks ago, and I couldn't get it out. And that was... You know, when I was powerlifting, it was it, it was everything. Yeah. I mean, anybody that knew me at the time would 100% fully agree that you know, I was a selfish prick. The only person I cared about was myself. All I fucking cared about was lifting weights. And that went on from 13 until too, too old, yeah. you know, for too long. And um, I don't regret it. You know, I do. Re- I do. I'm, I, I'm sorry for some of the things that I've said and done, but I, I don't necessarily regret that. But that's all in. And when you're 100% all in like that, and you truly have been there, and that this is the key thing, you truly have to know exactly what I'm talking about. Not like, well, yeah, I went all in for this party, or I went all in for two weeks before yeah. this wrestling tournament. I mean, all in. And then you sit back, and then you ask yourself, do I really want to be all in with my company? Or do I really want to be all in with my family as fucked up as it sounds but do i yeah. really want to be all in with my family because that means i may lose my company i may lose the ability to support them i think as you get older you can figure out a way to <clears throat> get the benefits of all in without the emotional and physical toll i agree uh i don't at a young age you don't know any better um and you know it's we talk about uh time management or whatever you want to say but uh emotionally <clears throat> like with to me it was football and uh, I'll never forget my final game I was walking out of the stadium and I remember thinking holy fuck what do I do I have nothing to do with my life like everything that I did from you know every class that I took was based around football like shit can I get the practice and, and stuff like that all my entire off season and I'm like I have nothing to show for this man I'm not going to the pros and it wasn't until, you know, 15 years later, I'm like, man, I'm glad I did that. And so I think the rewards you reap sometimes of being all in don't show until later. Um, but uh, I still think that you are definitely, dude, look at this fucking place. You're all in on your company, but maybe you're not as. <clears throat> not as much as I was it, powerlifting. It, yes, but it's, it, uh, you're incredibly successful. Depending on who. Yeah, I know, but that's. I mean, we can we can go back and forth. I know, but here's the thing: is uh, you know, here here let 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 me let me wrap let me let me go down this this rabbit hole. Is here's the way that I have come to define success in a very morbid fucking way. A couple years ago, I was at a, I was at a funeral, and it was. like an in-law of, yeah, you someone know, of, a, a family member, you know, so not somebody I really knew, you know, somebody I knew of. I was there for support for other people. Yeah. And while I was there, you know, I'm looking around during, you know, the wake and funeral and so forth. And I realized, you know what, there's like five, six people, you know, up by the casket. They're, they're hurting, man. Yeah. Their, their lives just changed forever. They're going to be thinking about that person every day for the rest of their life. And then a little bit back further were the people that were there to support those people. Yeah. You know, out of respect, they came because of those people. A little further back, kind of like sitting in the chairs where I was, flipping through, <laughs> you know, my phone. The you know, trying, everybody's trying to figure out, well, how long should yeah. we stay here until we can get out of here for dinner? <laughs> All right. And then I started wondering, you know, who am I really living for? Am I living for the people in the back seat flipping through yeah. their phone, or am I actually spending my time living for the people who are going to remember me every single day for the rest of their life? And if that is true, what are they going to take away from that? Yeah, you know. So, will you talk about getting rid of people, the cancers, in your life, or 
you know, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, you basically, no matter how big you are, uh, whether you're the president of the United States, you know, when you pass away, it's still five or six people that are really hurt than the rest. Oh, of yeah. Now, you're, you know, you might have a bigger funeral and all that other bullshit. But at the end of the day, the, the, you know, the world keeps turning. Sun comes up, sun comes down. Uh, so the decisions that, you know, I've I've come to make and it's just kind of been over my entire life slowly, you know, because I like everybody, I've made my fair share of mistakes, if not more, are I think about those people first. Yep. Then I think about whatever that other decision is. So if it's a business decision, okay, how is it going to impact those people? Yes. You know, and then is this high risk, low risk, medium risk? Yeah, it's, it's not. I'm not saying I'm not going to take high risks. That's a necessary part, you know, of being a business. If you're not willing to put your balls to the grindstone, yes. you're going to go out of business. By no means am I saying you can just coast through it because you can't. It's, it's too it's too vicious of an environment too competitive of an environment to always have to be the nice guy or whatever somebody wants to say. Yes. You know, you have to do what's right for the values of the company, which is, you know, another conversation that can go on, which is interesting because I remember when I first set them down, it was me, you, maybe Chris and Tracy, that might've been it. And I said, Hey, we need some values for this company. And we wrote them down and I kind of brainstormed them through a book that I found on best way to do that. And I remember you telling me, are you willing to abide by these no matter what? <laughs> and I says, well, what do you mean? He says, unconditionally, Yeah. you know, like these, these have to matter. Even if you don't like what the outcome of it's going to be, are you willing to, to do that? Yeah. If it's, if you're willing to, risk something or, yeah and yeah. I, I didn't know i had to i had to table it for a week <laughs> and yeah. i had to think about whoa, it whoa, because whoa. it's like well he, he's got a point and it that kind of goes back to somebody was asking about firing and so forth you got to have a certain set of standards or guidelines or we have a three strike process you know okay. there, there has to be certain things there has to be you know there isn't here's one executable thing you're gone that you, you know some things yeah. You know, they're, they're, that's an outlier situation. But if it's a set of a warning type situation, then we have a three-step process that we follow if it's an employee or if it is, it's a team member. They all follow the same things. It doesn't matter if it was fucking JL got, you know, log taken away because he was he was one of my best friends, Yeah. you know, because of that. And once I had the conversation with him, he was 100% cool about it. It was the best thing, you know, at the time for that. But you can't have conditions on that. The same way you can't do that with your athletes. You know, you yeah. can't treat one better than when you're going to treat another, given the exact same situation. Yes. Yes. Well, that's, you know, it's, I could uh, counter that with something. Is uh, I wrote an article about this, about being a walk-on and what it taught me. And in the, <clears throat> it's a little bit different than what you said, but uh, I realized if I'm not the head cheese, I'm not the quarterback, I'm not the star running back, I I can't get away with as much. So I'll give you an example. Uh, how do I put this? I, I guess I'm kind of, <clears throat> and I'm not saying you run. The most people run businesses with you know with a or anything a team. You get uh, a little more leeway with. <clears throat> uh, what you uh, provide. Yes. Since I'm just Joe Blow walk on, I can't get away with missing team meetings and stuff. If you're the starting quarterback, True. and I learned real quick, you know, in this world, you know, nothing's fucking fair. It was a horrible, you know, in, in high school, they always try to, you know, everyone gets the same punishment and stuff. But the reality was, it's, you know, and my wife pounds that in our kid's head. It's like, dude, life is not fucking fair. Like, you know, sometimes you lose your Legos. It's just the way it goes, man. Um, and uh, I learned real quick, like, you know, my value for a lot of things is based on what I bring to the table. And if it's, you know, if it's subpar, then that's just the way it goes. I'm just not, uh, I, I guess that to me, the, the walk-on thing and, and uh, my value and stuff, I realized where I stood in the hierarchy of football. 
I'm going to change my answer because so. you just called me out, and it, it um, and, and it's well, here's, it's true though. It's true because, um, with with certain things, it's true. Well, here, here's the thing, Dave. Let's say you had a guy. It, it this wouldn't be applicable to this company, but let's just pretend you have company A builds widgets or whatever the fuck it is, and he came in, sat down at a table, thought of something, and is like, "Man, look at this. The schematic. This just made you a billion dollars in you know." Mm-hmm. 2019 and he's like listen i'm out of here i'll see you man <laughs> and you're like well what about you know the meeting he's like i didn't go to the meeting i just made you a billion fucking dollars like you can't really fire that guy for leaving the meeting mm-hmm. now the guy who doesn't really do anything or you know not you know what i'm saying yes is not as important you know, and that is it, it matter you know so i think even with the way you with i coach kids for example the way you deal with kids is going to be different because this is <clears throat> on a human level. Some kids don't respond to screaming and yelling. Some yes. kids, you got to, I try to have good positive feedback. Uh, some kids, you can just like, dude, that fucking sucked. Holy shit, what happened? He's like, hey, yeah, yeah, fucking sucked. I, I, get, I think he laughs it off. You do that to other kids, you know, they're going to they're gonna be crying, they're going to be feeling down. Uh, so everything's going to be treated a little bit differently. But, you know, it's, you're, <clears throat> even in society, I'll give you an example is, uh, let's say you, uh, you, you're a doctor and you give free health care to homeless people on the weekends. You're worth more than a rapist. Would you agree? Right? <laughs> no, I don't, and that's where I have a trouble with people like, ah, oh, everyone's the same. It's like, no, you're not, dude. That dude's doing fucking good work. That guy's helping his community. That guy's, you know, he's got three kids. His wife passed away from cancer. He's raising three kids and he brought in a foster kid. Look at that fucking dude. And then some dudes over there, uh, you know, mooching off the fucking system because he's got a bad back. It's like, he's not worth as much. Mm-hmm. And it's just a hard reality to take. And I, that's the biggest takeaway I got from college football. It was like, fuck, dude, my worth. <laughs> like, I have to bring something to the table. And uh, that, that does, that's a little bit different with the three strikes thing because... Not, not necessarily, though, because there's, there's high-end mistakes, right? So, <laughs> say in business, if it's sexual harassment, problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, or if it's theft, problem. <laughs> You know, if it's somebody that wants more flexible hours, but they're yeah. getting their shit done all the time. Yeah, what do you get? Like, yeah, go ahead. You know, do what you want to do. Now, somebody else gets pissed because they have more flexible hours with the other person doesn't, yeah. but they're not getting their shit done. We'll get your shit so, done. Yeah. You that's know, what I'm trying to say yeah. is... is uh, that, that is the real world. That's where you're 100% yeah. true. And what I tried to drive home to my pain-in-the-ass fucking 15-year-old is... <laughs> You know, <laughs> attitude and execution, and it, it matters. You know, getting yes, things done matters. You know, he didn't want to go to baseball practice because it wasn't mandatory. I'm like, that's when you have to go. Yeah. So the coach, even if you suck, yep. the coach sees you there. Dude, and it is funny because uh, in a room of 50 or 60 kids, I see a lot of shit. I'm like, you really think I don't fucking see this stuff? Guys? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, I just burped. But it's funny because as, when you're a kid, you think you're getting away with everything. Mm-hmm. And then when you're when you're a parent or a dull or coach, you're like, dude, you know, I see most of the like you might you're gonna get away with some. It's like speeding. You know, you'll get away with some, but you're gonna get caught, right? Yes. And uh, you know, coaches got you know the, <clears throat> my vision's fucking horrible now as we discussed, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I still see stuff and I hear stuff and uh, so. <clears throat> How do you address it? Like I said, you have to like the the bad attitude. Well, just say it's. I mean, there's some stuff that's off the cuff. You're just gonna let it fly. But the the the, the you know it's 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 going to lead to a hurricane. Yeah. Uh, well, we had uh, we don't really have that many issues. I'll be honest, and that again has to do with. I think it has to do with being where we are. London's different than being, let's say, Dublin. Or is it cutting it off before it becomes a problem? The other thing is, <clears throat> our my fir- like we had the. My uh, first off season, and then we had the first good year, right? Those seniors were so – they had been part of the program for four years. They had some tough times, and they were so intent on owning their own program. Does that make sense? Like mm-hmm. taking responsibility that they dug their field, their, their hands in the dirt uh, and didn't let anything co- – if you didn't show up, if you didn't give effort, if you had a shitty attitude, they called you out on it. We talk about building leaders in the weight room. And then the next group comes in, and instead of, uh, you know, <clears throat> sometimes like the seniors will become 
you know, I was hazed as a freshman, you're getting hazed, right? You hear that bullshit. Instead of that, it was, this is the way it's done. We're going to do things right. And you better fuck, you know, we're going to spray down the like kids. We spraying down the equipment, clean up the fucking weight room. This is our weight room, you know, and some kids, you know, <clears throat> the seniors get it. And that's what I want passed on. So that's addressed. But, you know, <clears throat> one of the things you have to do is you, you just have to pull them aside. Like, dude, this isn't, you know, I know you can do better than this. You know, is there something going on? Uh, so I think you have to, <clears throat> the kids address it, but I think as a coach, you need to address it too. But I always just take them aside and just speak to them like a human being. Uh, they're, they're not adults, but they're humans. Like they're, you know, and if, <clears throat> if all you do is yell at them and criticize them and get on them, then I don't think it helps anything. And I think growing up when we did, when we played football, you never got a compliment, <laughs> right? No, no. <laughs> you fucking fat piece of slow shit. <laughs> And uh, holy shit. Now, that still goes on to a degree in football because that's the way football is. Football is a very demanding uh, sport. Uh, but I've, I, I have found way <clears throat> uh, it's much easier to get kids to cooperate when you're positive with them. Uh, and I always, always try to set it up so that kids have some kind of success on a daily level. Like, wow, you really did that well. Look at that. Like, you know, so I set up their weights. They're never, I don't want a kid maxing out and failing. If you and I fail on a two board, it's like, yeah, fuck it. You know, yeah. <laughs> if a kid fails and it's like, man, what did, what did I do wrong? It's my fault. Well, I tell them all the time, if you miss weights on your big lifts, that's my fault. That means I didn't program correctly or I didn't you see something, you know, um, but you can, you know, you can catch more bees with honey bullshit. And I think it's more, it might, may have been true when we were kids. Maybe they just didn't do it like that. But I think it's very true now. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like, you know, fucking throw a confetti in a party. You just have to give them a pat on the back. Like, dude, that was fucking awesome. Now you're starting to get it, you know. And uh, it's hard, you know, <clears throat> as a parent, because you're around your kids so much. That you're right, you want to like do what the fuck? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It cannot be this annoying. It's almost impossible. <laughs> I, it, it is <laughs> like there, and so uh, with that, and I have to, you know, the, so you have to compliment, you know, as much as you can, and not bullshit compliments. Um, now you did, really, you know, my youngest son doesn't respond to overzealous compliments, right? If he he's written, I don't know why, but he writes fucking books all the time. He's got probably ten full books that he's wrote and illustrated and i don't know what it is but he doesn't want you to compliment on so i just that's a pretty fucking good book dude pretty you, good. you really don't know what it is well i, dude, I don't write any books like that <laughs> listen asshole <laughs> uh but it's it's really interesting uh so with him you know it's not the it's just that yeah, you did good like picture's pretty good and he's happy like you can't give him too much or he's like don't look at it you know so again that's a person on person basis but uh the bottom line dave is this is in this day and age you have to be a more positive than you think and i and uh and that goes like when i walk into that weight room that, it's not my job there it's not very hard it's not like i'm buddy morris and some of those guys remember how many hours they spend uh but i have to make sure i come in there with a good attitude because <clears throat> i am the leader in that weight room so i want to present like, if I come in there all mopey, and then what do you think is going to happen, right? If you come in the house and you're all pissed, you know what happens. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know what, I'm going to put on. So I try to have the you know, positive attitude and stuff. And uh, I mean, it, <clears throat> there's a lot that goes into that as far as making sure the kids are successful. I'll give you just the easiest one. Uh, when we do some of our running <clears throat> at, towards the end of the off season, we start timing some of the runs so the kids, I know that the kids are where they need to be right? We don't have a conditioning test, but we have standards. And uh, let's say we're running 50s or 100s or something, and the kids are coming in slower. Well, I, and I know they're giving great effort. Then I know, like, it's my fault. Like, I must have, they fucking tired or something, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I just call it wrong times. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys did good. <laughs> Fuck yeah, we're making all our times. And I just increase the rest periods a little bit <laughs> because the kids don't know, like, after a while. Yeah. And it's so... The old way, when you and I were playing football, was just, fuck it, you got to keep running. What does that accomplish? Then they're more tired because they've already been tired. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you know, they're give, you know when they're giving effort. So I just read off wrong fucking times. I'm like, yeah, you guys did good. So now that they have a sense of accomplishment, and it's not done in a, you know, everyone's the best, right? 
Does that make sense? Like that's there's a whole other ball game. So, um, but I you know. <clears throat> I'm not just training for that day. Like we talk about some of the bullshit training that we've seen over the years. In the last 10 years or so, some real <laughs> shit fucking programming. <laughs> yep. And I train when well, we train with the big picture in mind. So uh, I want the kids to come back Wednesday or Friday and have a great day. If I beat the fuck out of them on one day, you know, I talk about climbing a ladder all the time. The ladder is 300 feet. Every day we go up one rung. So I don't want too much. I don't want too little. If we have a crazy day, we knock them down 30 rungs. Now we've got to fucking start up. Because let's say we train like shit, like fucking crazy on Monday. We've had this happen. Then Wednesday rolls around like, Dave, you really want to bench today? Uh. Oh. And then Wednesday's ruined. And then Friday, we're like, eh, let's just get back into it. So we've ruined the whole fucking week because of one fucking day. Well, optimally, you want them at the top of the ladder after the four years because now yes. they're on a new building. Yes. Yes. You know, so. And don't even get me started on when I send the kids off. Holy shit, Dave. The workout programs I see, like they send them their summer pack. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God, Dave. I, mean, but I, I think that's getting into an area that you can't control. I can't control. I, can, I know I can't. You know, And, and I, 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 I let it go, but it breaks my heart, man. I'm like, dude, yeah. we, we've, you know, <clears throat> there's a reason, why, you know, I'm not the only reason why. But physically, we're dominant. Well, I'll pause there just for a minute. You, got, you do have a great coach. You know, that we're we're gonna, that that's already yeah. been established. There is a great coach there. This, this is a small league, right? This is a farm town league. Yeah. This is not a league that has Catholic schools that are recruiting people. No. This is not a league that has any school that I know of that's yeah. recruiting kids from other schools. The only time you get your dick sanded is when you go to the playoffs. And then you got to play. Yes. Those Catholic schools. Now, when you're that small town league, and this is not that's, this is not putting down small town leagues in any way whatsoever. Strength fucking matters. Yes, well, we saw a we lot. Saw, two things matter. Well, there's, there's there's a lot of things that matter, but I'm gonna go over this real quick. Is uh, being physically stronger helps you mentally and physically. There's no. It doesn't even matter if you play football or not. Okay. Number two is <clears throat> with this work we do in the weight room and the work we do in the conditioning, the work we do on the field, the small things fucking matter. If that foot is not behind the line, those kids will call that fucking kid out and they will grill him because that's not what we, how we do things, okay? So all the small things, you know how that shit goes, yeah, right? You dot, your, <clears throat> dot your I's, cross your T's, everything, all the small shit matters. So our first playoff game we play in, uh, of, we should have not won that game. We shouldn't have won any playoff games uh, d- d- based on who we played. Their team did so many things wrong, it drove me crazy. I wanted to be like, dude, come on, man. <laughs> like, just fucking right, line up right. Mm-hmm. Like, it was driving, because like, we're so adamant about doing the right things. Like, I'll give you an example. When it's, your workout says 225 or 220, you don't put 225 on. Because that little shit matters. It's just a little discipline thing. Mm-hmm. And does it really matter, Dave? Not really, no. but discipline yeah. does. But discipline does, so... Then we see a team that we, they should have fucking killed us, and we just run all over them. In fact, they, we ran over them so much that they got – because they ran one of those fancy spread offenses. The team was uh, yelling at us at the end of the fourth, you know, at the fourth quarter, you guys don't even know how to fucking play football. This ain't football. Because <laughs> we just run like the wing tee, <laughs> which was like the very first offense ever <laughs> invented. And it's like, we don't know how to play football. We're fucking kicking your ass all over the place mm-hmm. with what football really is. We're not playing basketball on turf. And – uh and then our second playoff game, again, we, you know, it's easy to be a big fish in a small pound. In a, in, you know, we played the most physical dominant team in Division Four for the last 12 years, and we beat the fuck out of them. Now, we had some great players. You know, we had tremendous running backs and stuff. But everyone else is a supporting character. And it's funny because I always tell people that, you know, let's say we had a six foot five. 250 pound dude who's shredded runs a four six strength training is not going to help him that much i mean it will but not that much but the kid who can't really do anything that's where the program starts to help where now he can become a contributor or a starter and, and then you get enough of those i told a strength coach one time he came up to me after the game he's like man what do you guys do i'm like my goal is just make my average guy kick your average guy's ass all over the fucking place that's my only goal because our you know your freak is always going to be your freak but if i can get a bunch of kids who are just like man eh, you know all of a sudden, after four years, they got triceps that hang off their arms, <laughs> you know? And 
in in high school football, you're going to have a lot more average guys than you have freaks, especially in a smaller town, uh, and that doesn't, like you said, recruit kids. Uh, then all of a sudden, it, it, <clears throat> your freaks don't matter as much anymore because now they're getting, you know, everyone else in the team is on their back. You go ahead and make a play, dude. <laughs> yeah. You know. And, you know. So, uh, but uh, I think I, I've said this in the EF when I did the what do you call sports seminar? Yeah. That, uh, you know, the goal is to make the, the bench warmer into a contributor, the contributor into a starter, the starter in all conference. And again, after four years, you see some kids that, you know, I had kids play amazing that you're like, man, I, there's no way like, four years ago I could see you. One of our kids, uh, I'm not going to name him or something, but he's not very athletic at all. You could hear him running. He runs with heavy footfalls, you know, probably runs like a 5'5". Five, five. He had 20 pancakes in the game against an all-state kid. Pancakes. And not just on the – I mean, I'm talking 20 yards mm-hmm. down the field, bent them over. He doesn't even know how to talk trash. He's too smart to talk trash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, he's like, you don't even know what fucking pie is, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you think a cosine and a sine is the same motherfucking thing? Uh, so <laughs> you know what a tangent is? <laughs> and uh, – but, you know, that's just a result of him again. And it was funny because the first time he played was a year prior. And uh, it was against the same team he had, whatever. But the bottom line is he got a couple pancakes and he ran off the field. He's like, Coach Wendler, I'm what? And he's like, it's so easy if you only have one job. Because <laughs> all he had to do was not let the guy cross his face or something. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's fucking football, baby. <laughs> you only really have one job. <laughs> you can ask big questions. I'm not going to be able to look through this. All right. Yeah, you can ask another one. We're just blabbing about it. Well, we got a bunch of comments and uh, uh, comments. comments and you guys are old. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are funny. Some of them, uh, like one of them, the guy said Jim needs to get core values tattooed on his forearm because he asked Dave that every time. Core value? Oh. So, yeah, apparently you asked him that last time. Yeah, yeah. I think, it, dude, I'm telling you, having that, and that was 2003, I still stick to that with training. Everything I do with training has to has five. I have five values of training that I do, and if it doesn't stick to that thing, I fucking toss it. Toss it. What are the five values? Of training, start too light, progress slow, use compound movements, attempt to set PRs in some sort of way. Okay, and there's a lot of ways you can do it. And number five is the new one I added last two. This I had. You know, it took me two years to add this. Or what? What year is this right now? 2019. 2019. So it took me eight years to add a fifth one, and that means balance. And all that means is uh, if you're a power lifter, you have to do something other than just maximal strength, mobility. You have to have some kind of car- – so that, does that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean GPP if you yeah, go old yeah. school. But uh, you have to have some kind of balance in your training. And uh, – so even even with coaching, I, don't, I haven't got there just yet. But you know, number one thing I tell people when they coach is don't coach what you don't know. That doesn't mean you can't learn. But holy shit, can you? I like guess why reason I don't. There's a number of reasons why we don't power clean. But the number one is, is I can't coach sixty kids at once to power clean or hang clean or whatever the hell you want to. And so I'm just not going to do it. Now it would <clears throat> logic tells me right every program in the world. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Fucking power clean. You got to do it. But I'm like, well, what's the point? If I don't know what I'm doing, you know, if, if you're a body weight only guy and you became a head strength coach, I just do the body weight shit until you figure out how to squat if you choose to do that. Yeah. Does that make sense to yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so like all these fancy things that I see people doing, I don't understand them, so I'm not going to do it. Like, I don't know it. I can't coach it. How can I expect these kids to do it if I don't know it? So I'm, I'm currently trying to figure out, like, my core values of – uh, of coaching and stuff. And I'm, you know, I have <clears throat> same thing. My wife and I do core values at home, you know, and I think that's super important. And so it's funny that the biggest takeaway I get was that stupid fucking thing you probably presented 15, 16 yeah. years ago, Dave. Well, it's, uh... And it didn't, and it's, we all know the 10 commandments, mm-hmm. right? But I think we need something more personal. 
Yes, and that's where the core values come in. The core values are basically just this basic statement of what you want to strive for, but then they become standards. Yes. And standards become and, quantifiable. And when shit hits the fan, you go, what are, you know, holy, f how many times did shit hit the fan and you went off the base, went off the fucking oh, reservation, man. and you're like, dude, what the fuck? There were a few times we had to sit down and say, here, guys, <laughs> we need to look at these values. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, that meeting would last five minutes. Yeah. Oh, It'd be shit. like, oh, fuck. <laughs> There it is. Turn the ship right around. You know, and, there uh, we go. Fuck, I don't want to do this, but... And the other thing that I think it makes better in your life, it makes your decisions easier. Yes. Uh, because you don't have to wrestle with this and that. You're like, listen, this, this is what's important. I'm going to stick with this, and it's gotten me this far, and I know these are right. That's the, you know, the thing. Well, they're that, you. Yeah. That's why it took you years to develop that. Yeah you, can't, yeah, you can't just sit down like in five minutes and figure... Like, I've been coaching for God knows how long now, and I still don't have them, and I, you know, I will... Uh, but it, I'm still young, you know, with what I'm doing, I've only been doing this for, I don't know, I have no idea. And it will still, the thing is, they'll still evolve to where, you know, ours used to be, as far as the company used to be, you know, nine or 10 or 11 or whatever it is. And now it's just focus. <laughs> yeah. Now it's just focus, trust and strength. Yeah. You know, it's all been brought down into three, which is easier to... That was, I was going to say, as, as you get older, they get shaved down. They get shaved down, they be compiled and then they, they can't just be me. You know, because it's now, it's a company, yeah. it has to represent more where your strength training values for the team have to be team structured values. Yes. They're, they're different than what your family is going to be. Yes. Or what your own personal ones are going to be. And uh, it's it's a, uh, I, I, I think the best thing is, is like I, when Dave said it, the meeting took five minutes, is it makes things fucking easy in your life. And even George Carlin had a great bit about the Ten Commandments. He's like, uh, you know, we can whittle all these down. I think he did the two. Like one was, don't be an asshole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that's pretty much what it comes down to. And, uh, you know, so I, I, uh, I think as you get older and as you refine, nothing, very few things ever get added. Most, most of the time things get chopped yeah. away. Now, the meeting to – decide make a decision based on the values is what was five minutes the meeting to come up yeah that's different the, that's that, that's a, that may that's take a years month. that's a long long time well how long have you had the company when did you 21 start? years well how when when did you start 1998 98 so it took maybe five years because you don't know what the fuck you're doing the first yeah first 10 i mean <laughs> it, was, it was probably i mean it was after you were hired that the values yeah uh, i realized something had to come into play because there were so many decisions that had to be made so fast. And we weren't growing dynamically. People misunderstand that. We've never had this great dynamic growth. I don't think I've ever grown more than 15% in one year. But still, when you're going from nothing and you're, yeah. you're with folding tables and putting out five orders per day, then the next day there's like 10. You're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> How is this going to happen? You know, you, you, there, there has to start to become systems but then the systems didn't work because we would outgrow the systems within two weeks here's you know to give people an idea of what elite fts and i started in 2003 my second week here dave and tracy left me alone first vacation one yeah years. they hired me to take a vacation <laughs> pretty much what it came down to because you can't plan a vacation in a week uh so one week, and that means all the orders, all the phones, uh, whatever, you know. Uh, so one person packaged everything up, answered all the phones, did all that shit for a week. And uh, you couldn't, this place would fucking burn down if one mm -hmm. person was, you know, right? No, and so if you really, <clears throat> so, but that was, what, 16 years ago. So, and then... When I was here, it'd be one person would get added, and it would be a long time till another person got added, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Uh, so you're right, it, nothing. But you know, the the fast the growth, the fast the fall. Mm -hmm. Same thing with like losing weight. People are like I lost sixty pounds this month. Like, man, it's going right back on, buddy. Well, I've done it twice. <laughs> I've mastered that skill. You know, the the one thing that's that uh, that's always funny when I start. When we have discussions about the history of the company, I'm like, well, you know, 98, then you came in in 2003. Most of the people listening to this were still in their play pens with a diaper and a rattler yeah. when we were answering questions on the Q&A. Yeah. You know, so it's... Um, well, it's interesting to think, though, in 2003, I was here. 
in 2001, I was still, I was doing a Q and A's mm -hmm. at, at Kentucky. Uh, yeah, about 2001. So that puts a lot of the listeners in a playpen. Yes. With a diaper. Actually, a yes. lot of the, a lot of the online experts today. Yeah. In, in, in a playpen with a diaper trying to figure out <laughs> how to deadlift yeah. a rattle. How to not shit their pants. <laughs> how to not shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, while shitting their yeah, yeah. and I, a lot of, yeah, so yeah, and uh, that is a crack on online trainers. But I am going to give the ones that are good credit. So you guys that are good, you do get credit. But I, I'm going to take the jabs when I can. I, uh, what is it? Only three spots left. Only three <laughs> spots left, man. That's the best thing ever. <laughs> I just snorted. <laughs> yep, that, I kind I kind of ripped that off Fifty Cent because he had one that was um, get the strap. I'm like, all right, I need to come up with something to put it at the end of my post. That's funny. So only three spots left for fucking everything. All right. We got, what, a, we got a ton more good questions, but I got a personal one. Yeah, yeah, the last yeah. last time we did this table talk a few years ago. Okay. You mentioned um, you got into, I don't know if you want to talk about this, so if not. No, go ahead. You got into a serious motorcycle accident. Yeah. You said you almost died. I just wanted, I was wondering if you could tell that story and then how that changed your perspective. Uh, perspective, that's probably a big one. Yeah. The, uh. Just, uh, I don't know, what, I couldn't even tell you what year it was. I didn't even know how long it's been since my surgery. Um, Ten years ago, probably. Yeah, it's probably been uh, eight years, I think. Yeah, I was just, I was riding home. My buddy and I did a massive East Coast Southern tour on our motorcycles, and we were heading home on 70. We just crossed into Ohio, and some dude was fucking texting and hit me, uh, and I you know, hundred yards smashed down that highway. And, uh, I won't get into specifics, but I thought I was fucking dead. I remember when he hit me, I was like, this is, this is how I'm going. Fuck. That was like a real weird realization of your death. It's, I imagine that's what it's like when you're surfing and you get crushed by a wave and you know, you're not coming up. You're like, this is it. Uh, anyway, I ended up surviving. And, uh, I, when I was laying in the ditch, cause I was, I, I finally stopped <clears throat> skidding across the road in the in the road and I had no semblance of where I was and I just started rolling and I was hoping I was going to roll one side or the other because I didn't want to get hit by a car and I rolled into grass and gravel and I was like thank god and uh I just remember my wife at the time was six months pregnant and I was like fuck dude I'm never going to see my family again that's the only thing that went through my mind uh was I, I'm never going to see my kid I'm never going to see Mason again and, you know, what a shitty way for a dad to go out, right? Hey, Mason, by the way, I know you're in Texas. <laughs> Your dad got uh, hit just outside of, you know, West Virginia. What if, uh, so uh, I guess the, the main thing was is <clears throat> my initial reaction was, uh, like, I'm so happy to be alive. I just wanted to do whatever I wanted to do. And it wasn't like a... Like, I'm going to go skydiving or anything like that. I was just so excited to be alive that I wanted to do as much shit as I could. Um, and, you know, I was back. I loved, obviously, training is a big part of my life. I think I was training not right after, but as soon as I could do something. And it was just, you know, a dumbass fucking move. Like, I want to see if I can lift, you know. And, you know, they had to scrape the, the gravel out of my back, the road rash, with a steel brush. You want to know what fucking pain is? <laughs> I mean, just fuck, I was just sitting there and, uh, lucky, like everything hurts. So it just more hurt. Yeah. If yeah. that makes sense. It's yeah, like, yeah. uh, you know, breaking your arm and then someone breaking your leg and all of a sudden your arm doesn't feel that bad anymore. <laughs> so, uh, but this it was a weird near death thing that I, I imagine that's what it's like to be a semblance of what it's like to be in Iraq and Afghanistan in a firefight where you're this. And maybe there's probably times you feel more confident, but other times maybe you're pinned down. And you're like, Jesus Christ, I'm going to die in a fucking, you know, some sand trap in the Middle East. And this is all I got. And uh, but I was never more happy to be alive. And to, this is the same kind of thing as, you know, my whole life, not my whole life, but <clears throat> when I bought my first house, you know, I was so excited. And most people are, right? And I still live in the same house and it's, we've financially, we can afford better, but we don't cause we're going to own our house next year. I'll never have to make a house payment again. I don't give a shit. I don't care if my house isn't big. I don't have to pay anything, 
But I, there isn't a time that I drive up that I'm not fucking proud of that. Taxes. Yeah. Oh, dude, our taxes are so low. No, you're going to, oh, well, that's good. But you're going to own the house. I, I'm, yeah, I'm I, with I, you on that. Yeah, but property taxes are yeah. you know, around here are not what they, you know. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> it, you know, I, I probably occasionally lose sight of it just like we lose sight of the values. But, uh, you know, occasionally I, I still remember um, it's, it's life affirming. I think it's good. I think it's, <clears throat> I don't want to, this sounds like a dickhead thing to say. I think, being almost near death is a good thing. It really was. It was for me uh, because I, I got to understand how important my wife is and my kids are and my friends are. And, and, you know, I don't take every day I train and this, you know, I train in my garage. I don't take any of that for granted anymore because for years I had such a bad back after that motorcycle accident, I couldn't do anything. And then after the surgery, you can't do anything. And now and I squat down. I'm like, man, I can fucking squat. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm very appreciative of that. You know, I'm very appreciative of everything I have. And I think as you get older, you end up doing that for the most part. But, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the other day, I thought, like, my God, my wife, I'm so happy to have her. She's such a, an ally in my life. And <clears throat> there's a really goofy movie called Four Christmases. And they're playing this uh, wife or couple versus couple and they're it's like they turn over a little hourglass and she asked him questions and they have to answer and uh <clears throat> he 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 asked her uh, this is what you gave me on tuesday and uh she's like uh alibi <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that's fucking awesome like <laughs> yeah i know you murdered someone i'll fucking cover for you and that's you know i'm so so lucky to have her and i'm lucky to have my kids and you know i never get to see my oldest son enough but I'm very, you know, I tell him all the time because he gets sad about it. I'm like, dude, in the big picture, you're fucking lucky. You got a mom who loves you. You got family. Your grandma and grandpa on both sides love you to death. Like, be happy. You know, be appreciative of what you have. So, and I guess that's what it comes down to. But holy shit, uh, I uh, <clears throat> I see people in in shitty situations, man, and I. Uh, I feel for them, and I, I hope that they have the same realization that I did because I see a lot of people uh, just go back to their old ways, just kind of shitting on life. And just. And I'm not saying I'm going out and destroying the world, you know, like, uh, you know, because that's not my attitude. I just want to be with my family and hang out. And, and uh, does that make sense to you? It makes sense to me. I mean, I, I, I'm I'll do, echo. I'm, I'm, this, I'll echo the same sentiments, but I'm not going to go into details in regards to the situation, but – the you 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 come out a little different yeah. actually you come out a lot different you know it's things that you didn't think mattered like my house is almost paid off as well yeah and so when i think of that now it's not like yeah cool my house is almost paid off it's like if anything ever happens to me yes. beyond that that's one less thing my wife has to worry about yep now what else can i take off that plate that if i'm to check out they don't need to worry about yeah, we Meanwhile, pay. still growing as people, you know, my kids not, you know, having everything handed to yeah. them, but God forbid my eldest is going to need care forever. Is that going to be taken care of? You know, those type of things become more clear. Yes. You know, decision making is more clear. The things that you used to get real pissed off and stressed about doesn't, it's like, dude, what the, f and I understand why I used to get mad about it before, but and I, I don't think that's age that changes that. I really don't. I think it's circumstances and but, what you've been through. But here's the thing is when we were in high school, let's say uh, we're two girls in high school and we go to the prom, we're wearing the same dress. And that's a big fucking deal, right? All that's doing is training you to deal with something eventually 30 years later. It's a little stepping stone. So it's, mm -hmm. you can't expect the 13-year-old girl or 15-year-old girl to squat 800 pounds because she doesn't have the stress of building up. So all those little things that you think matter in high school, I always joke to say, well, they didn't really matter. Like all the classes you mm -hmm. took, yes, they did matter because they led you to <clears throat> develop your strength to deal with shit today. If that makes sense? Yeah. The, what does become, and I'll ask you this, what does become real hard is every now and again you'll get – you know, a friend or a close acquaintance that will bring a problem to you and you're listening to it and, and you, you, you care, you want to help them, yeah. you know, but in your mind, you're like, dude, seriously, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really hard to kind of like reel yourself back, yep. you know, and to get yourself back into that perspective. And then when you do, you're like, man, I'm so glad I'm not in this perspective anymore. Yeah. 
Uh, I had someone contact me about two months ago about that and uh, something uh, personal and stuff, and it was tough. And I said, dude, <clears throat> I I relayed uh, more so that, you know, you got to find your purpose, man, because if you have purpose, things not magically work out. You, f- you feel better. I have a purpose, like, and it's not just – and I think, like I said, for, for guys and maybe for some women, a oh guy that's, you know, who knows what I just stepped in right there. It can't be just your work and your family. It's got to be something else that's a little bigger. Now, uh, with what we, do, <clears throat> what we do, what you guys do here is bigger than just a company. Yeah. Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah. So that can have purpose. But I think if Elita, if you... If this becomes more than just or nothing but the business, then you lose your purpose. It's not. It's it, it, then it no longer should exist. Yeah. I mean, that's so. how my mind is. The you actually provided a good segue because there was a good question that I actually marked on one of the feeds that was in regards to women in the industry. You know, with the I, I, I remember the question pretty well. Somebody was asking. You know, with the increase in the number of women coming into strength and conditioning and the number of women coming into powerlifting, you know, what, what could be done, you know, to be able to help them? Why are they not being showcased? And, you know, I kind of read that a little bit with a grain of salt. And Well, I can, I can answer this perfectly. Well, you, you may have the same thought that I do. It's the, the first thing that went through my mind is you, you realize that we've had women as coaches and lifters on our website for close to 20 years now, you know, and one of the best strength coaches that I know that's worked every faucet of the industry is Julia Laduski. And I've still have yet to find any male strength coach of her equivalent in all different disciplines of the industry. So in a way I'm like, what you guys didn't realize that half of our website or half of our athletes have always been women and that the company is 60% female owned. You know, our, our warehouse manager is a female, the customer service manager is a female, the content manager is a female. Um, but I, I do get what they're saying and I do see what's going on from a bigger perspective because okay. I can sit here all day and brag about how great we do with it. Well, here's the thing, Dave, is uh, when I right when I got to Arizona – Meg Ritchie was the strength coach, but she had left. Okay. Good one. Meg Ritchie. Uh, and then when I was there, Carla Garrett was an assistant strength coach. Meg Ritchie. Uh, and so I knew all the guys who knew Meg Ritchie. No one ever mentioned she was a female. She was a fucking tough motherfucker. She's the one that tackled me at that one conference oh. about two years ago. <laughs> all right. So Meg Ritchie and then Carla Garrett. And she they helped out. And you have to understand, this is a very machismo football team at the time. We were... Uh, it, it was a different time of football, but things were tough. A t- lot, we had a, an era, an aura about us. Uh, never was it ever brought up that they were female. And I thought about this for a while, and I thought about other strength coaches that I worked with that were male, and they didn't get the same respect that Carla and Meg Ritchie got. So I started thinking about this, and I'm like, well, what are the two things that Meg and Carla had that were significant that maybe – uh, these other guys didn't have and it was that they did something and it doesn't matter if you're male or female you have to have done something to earn someone's respect you do not get respect by wearing a fucking badge or because you have the cscs or any other bullshit or because you you have an instagram account and you have to have something to stand on it doesn't matter if you're male or female that's what fucking drives me nuts they think it's because they're female you haven't done shit you have done fucking nothing. You don't get deserve anything, male or female. And that's just, you know how athletes are. You got fucking scars? Let me see them. All right, I'll fucking listen to you. There's not, there's not a single guy that I played with on a football team that gave a fuck. They're like, can you help me? Well, you did something. Okay, I'll listen to you. And then I've worked with females that haven't done shit. And they didn't get respect, and neither did the guys that didn't do anything. So I think playing the gender cards fucking bullshit. It really is because you have, and the same thing happened with me when I went to London. They had they. What did you fucking do? Not you know just because I'm bigger dude and covering tattoos. That didn't mean shit. What did you do something? And not only that, but I continued to do something. 
Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So I think if you want to get respect, whether you're male or female, you have to have something to stand on. And I don't care when people are like, well, you don't need to squat 800 pounds. No, but Meg Richards, fucking great thrower. So that requires a discipline that requires, uh, <clears throat> you know, some type of uh, context of understanding what it takes to be a great athlete. So I, I think that's a weak, pathetic card to play because I've seen it. I've seen guys in the strength industry get zero respect because they didn't do anything. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, a couple of things I can throw out just from conversations over the years. Dude, can you imagine a football team not giving a fuck about a female strength coach? You know how weird that is? They're not going to care. I mean, the team's Well, that's what I'm, but everyone think, right? If yeah. the one sport that's more male than anything, they don't give a shit. Yeah. Meg, you going to help us? All right, fuck it. Now, what I can't speak on is what the hiring bodies are going to think. That, that I can't because I don't know. You know, so I can't yeah, I really, I can't say, I'd say one way or another, but I do know that when the, the females that I've known in the, in the strength and conditioning industry, the, the collegiate industry typically end up in the Olympic coaching positions, which is the, the hardest to be in because yes, there's more athletes and more things that they have to deal with and yeah. they got to work a hell of a lot yep. harder and what the, from from a, to, to step out of that and look at it more from the online consulting and that type of perspective is, you know, the I think a lot of the question stems around, and this is usually how it works, is, you know, the ones who are showing their tits and ass are getting more clients than the ones that aren't. And to me, that's just poor client education. You know, the, the clients need to be educated on what is a good coach and what's not a good coach. And I think the whole industry as a uh, whole is, is failing that. Hold on one second, Dave. <clears throat> How long are you going to have those tits and ass? That's not a, that's not a long-term uh, business. Oh, they're model. not. It's not going to last. I mean, that's, that's what Julia's what I, been around for 20 years. That's what years. I'm saying. So why do you, like, <clears throat> then don't, you know, I had a girl ask me this in, at the Swiss conference she's like you know what do i do i'm everyone's showing their snatches and stuff and i'm like just don't do it just build slowly build man and you'll get there uh as long as you got something to stand on you can't just expect people just because you put up a few videos you know how long did it take you and i to even get remotely dude people we used to go places fucking people would say nothing to us mm -hmm. we were like the fucking runts of the litter we we've offered our services two strong dudes with backgrounds Nope. Nope. We don't want you. Was it because we're men? <laughs> right? No, no. And so the whole thing with like the, <clears throat> um, the, the TNA kind of thing, it's not a good business model to have. And so just weather the storm. How many times have you weathered the storm? Still do. Yeah. Still do. Now with, um, because you have a solid bit because yeah. your, your business is, is not based on TNA. Or whatever. Uh, the, my, 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 well, I've tore my D and pecs. B's. We'll call yeah, them dick I've tore my pecs. But um, <laughs> the one thing I've always thrown back, just out of curiosity, is when I'm asked that question, is you know, to to whoever's asking, how many strength coaches have you hired or have worked with that were female? And 100 percent of the time, the answer was zero. I'm like, well, if you can't help your own yeah industry because you want to hire you know, this guy for his reputation instead of hiring this female for her reputation, which again, you know, I can provide tons of names of people who can be able to do that, then there's another problem there. But I guess for... Here's the other thing, to, is, is uh, are you going to base your hiring process on merit or gender? You know, it better be, it better be merit. Yeah, I mean, so uh, if, <clears throat> if you don't stack up to the dude you're you're fighting, you know, your, your job against them. What do you, if you don't have the same resume or if, you know, uh, then what do you have to complain about? Yeah. You know, I, I, I bounce my ideas off my wife all the time. She doesn't want anything to do with the industry anymore. She got sick of it, but she still, <clears throat> I trust her judgment on a lot of stuff with, you know, understanding body movement and stuff like that. And, uh, it's not just because she's sleeping with me. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it, and I go with her to, you know, especially when I deal with kids because she's worked with kids a lot. So I'm always asking her, hey, is there something else I could do to help this out and then, you know, run it by her? So I, I, I guess 
the thing is, uh, it's more than just the gender thing. It's like the wage gap. It's not just because they're female. It's it's multifaceted. And, uh, but I think the most important thing, whether you're male or female, I don't care is you have to bring, like we talk about, we got to bring something to the table. Like you have to impress me a little bit, right? How it's hard. It's like when I, Vincent always says when he does the seminars, he's like, listen, nothing you're going to do is going to impress me, just so you guys understand. Oh, you'd be surprised how many people try to. Yeah, uh, it's, it's like, crazy. dude, you bench 275. Like, yeah. I did that overhead for 30 reps <laughs> like, exactly. you know, for, for Vincent. And so I think, uh, but at some point, you're going to have to do something. And that requ- uh, requires not just five years of work and not just 15. It, you know, at 20 years, you're starting to get your feet wet. And I always think, like, if you if you had to start over right today, like you, you can't get in the same mindset you had 20 years ago anymore. No. Like it's like, like you've, you've <laughs> right. I've, I've tried. I can't, yeah. I can't. And like my dad asked me one time, he's like, you still think you could do all the stuff you did, you know, walking on. And I didn't know a soul. I got off a plane with a bag to Arizona. I didn't know anyone. I didn't, you know, wasn't, and I'm like, there's no way I could do that anymore. Like, I was in a different place mentally where it was just me against the world. I didn't care. I was, you know, excited to be hit with a bunch of challenges. And I didn't, you know, it was just like, fuck it all. But put yourself in a different situation that's, that is in violation of one of your core values that directly impacts your business or company. And you're going to go at it with a vengeance smarter and stronger than you ever would have 20 years ago. So it is situational. Well, yeah. What, what I'm saying is, though, is, uh, uh, is I get what you're saying. I'm just trying to make. I'm trying yeah. to clarify it for the people listening. Yeah, what I'm saying is, is uh, you don't get to claim no one likes me. Yes. Five years into this, or twenty years into, this, or fifteen years, or whatever it is, it takes time, man. And uh, if all your time is spent online, then it's wrong. That's like the because it's it's yeah. a fucking house of cards, man. Yeah, go out, you know. And I I always laugh when uh, like you know how many high schools don't have a qualified hang strength coach, or you know how many teams like even if like the women's basketball team in London, like hey, you know I'd love to help you out. All right, fuck, be nice. You can get your foot in the door there. And that, now I used to have real world experience beyond training, you know. Joe Blow at Bally's or wherever the, I don't even know if Bally's is open. Yeah. And from the digital end, the one thing I was going to put out there is we accept outside submissions all the time. I mean, fuck, 20 years ago, you were the guy reviewing yeah. all those. We might get one every two months that's from a woman. Yeah. And this is out of dozens and dozens and dozens a week. So, you know, people can say, well, all you're doing is printing content that's coming from guys. Well, send me content. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's make it good content. Send it. Well, the, but, the, the, I got that. I got hit with that one time with the content shit. And I'm like, uh, first of all, you don't get to decide what my business does and doesn't. Go fuck yourself. Mm-hmm. And number two, how do you know? Because they wanted only black and gay people on my website. They said only them should be on your website. I'm like, well, how do you know they're not gay? We never even talk about their color mm-hmm. of their skin. Ever. Exactly. Ever. <laughs> exactly. Because it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. It's like for the first it time. It doesn't matter if you got a vagina or you're a wiener or you got a dick or if you like it in your mouth or whatever. It, like it's never brought yeah. up. So how the fuck do you know? And uh, for the first time ever, I just said that the company 60% female owned and every managing department is run by a female <laughs> out of 21 fucking years. <laughs> you know, so because like you just said, it doesn't matter. No. You know, um, but I do think this would be an interesting note to put down if we ever get Julia and Jessica, you know, together to kind of get, because I mean, we got two dudes here talking about, you know, just to get a different perspective and a different take on it would be, you know, interesting. You got anything else over there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, One of them was, uh, how did Jim come up with the 531? Well, yeah, that guy, don't answer that one because he should have done better with the question. Okay. I mean, you can't fuck up. There's three letter. There's three boop, boop, boop. numerals. Um, all right, I got one. Um, you guys have done these in the past, so if you want to skip them. There was one about the 531 that was kind of dual asked. Like, how did Jim come up with it? Then what did I think about it or some shit like that? Did it influence, you 
Obviously, I'm sure it did. Yeah. I mean, I can't. Uh, you know, I can. I can go back to uh, the original Boyd Epley's Nebraska program uh, was the original impetus for the training mix, uh, and I couldn't figure that out when I was a kid. Impetus. Yeah, you like that? Huh? I miss being around you. Yeah, my vocabulary <laughs> increases. Uh, so it was, I, I can't say one way or the other, you know, the direct thing, but there's no way you can spend 20 years or however long it was doing all these different things and not have everything creep into it. The one thing I'd like to address, and I got this, uh, I don't know if it was on who addressed, you know, brought this up, but what advantage does 531 have with my athletes versus conjugate training? So for once and for all, Dave, we're going to explain what conjugate training is so fucking people understand it. Because it drives me bananas. Conjugate training is the raising of several levels at the same time. So in, <clears throat> with that, in, it's, does that make sense? So it means our kids, so that means we're doing conjugate training. Our kids are getting bigger, stronger, faster, and better condition. Okay? That is what conjugate training, technically concurrent, but... That's what it is. It has nothing to do with board presses or box squats or speed day. It's the raising of several levels at once. That's why it's, it's great for a beginner, right? Because beginners can do all those things at once. And that's why <clears throat> technically with the super max phase and all this other stuff, it wasn't really technically conjugate training when we were doing it because we had different phases. We had, you know, Lactic acid tolerance training hit all these different things. Now blocks, yeah, blocks. So let's just understand that conjugate training is what it really is. I don't. There's a movie called The Princess Bride, and shit. What word did he say? Uh, in and consp- yeah, and the guy's like, I don't think you un- you know what that word means. <laughs> and I'd love to address that because I. How many times did we do seminars, and that's all we said? Like, listen, this is all you. This is these three things, and we're going to try and make you faster, stronger, and bigger at the same time, uh, without having the typical Western periodization thing where you had a, you know the different phases. And I, th- I always thought we made it so simple. Like, listen, you're going to have one day that's fast, one day that's slow, and after that, we're just bodybuilding. That's it. And so, with what we do, it's we have a strength part of the workout we have a speed part of the workout strength part of the workout a mobility part and a size part and then a conditioning part so it's it's this that is what conjugate training is so i, I wish uh it's like i don't even know do people read anymore i don't know you know i just uh. when he was working on 531 i mean really working on it, it's been a process since probably before he was ever employed with 100% because, so yeah it's because he we would have conversations on how his training with um what was a bigger faster stronger helped throughout his high school but he had to manipulate things to really make it work because some things weren't working no and it fucking sucked it sucked so he had to manipulate things so that was we had a lot of a lot of training people don't understand how many training conversations we had because if we, if we cared more about that than work um, work with it's, it's yes. chewing tobacco and tra- talking training and lower back. It, it was that and the Nebraska program that, yeah. uh, I, I'd never really, I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain, but, uh, they would have a, like they would give you a max. So your max is 30. Yeah. Then you would go down the chart and you'd have to do 10 reps here, 10 reps here, 10 reps there. Once you could f- finish that, then you would go up the other side. The, another yeah. five or ten pounds, then you would do the reps there. Now, if you didn't hit those reps, you would just continue doing it until you did. That seems like a really bad plan. Yeah. Really bad plan because you're never going to – what do you – you know, you're going to have – so it took me 15 years to understand, let's just go all the way over here. Yes. Finish all these reps, make it really light. Now we have some momentum building up. And that took – I was uh, 16, 17 when I found that out, and I fucked it up until. Well, there was a hiatus in there, too, where it was where, when you were training at Westside. Yeah, yeah. So when we were having these conversations, we would be talking about this in hotel rooms where there would be no fucking air conditioner and the door would be open and uh, all kinds yeah. of other shit were going on. And yeah. it was always an intriguing conversation because I, I've studied all training, you know, block training period. And I'm trying to, like, figure out, you know, is this, what is this? Because is this, like, you know, 
uh, bigger, faster? Is it is it Bill Starr? It's like this conglomerate. And I don't even think Jim had it really formulated in his mind. It was just the shit that he did to become a better player. And then and when it came time to get back to the town, it's like, well, fuck it, it's max effort day. And then yeah. you forget about it for the next 12 weeks because there's a meet. <laughs> and then um, he stepped away from the sport. I hung on for about a year and a half longer than what I really should have. But then I stepped away. And while he stepped away, he had a little group that he was working with out of the S4 compound at night. And then when I stepped away, I couldn't, for, for identity crisis prevention, which wasn't going very well, as Jim could probably attest to if he was going to be totally honest. I couldn't be around <laughs> other people when when they were training. I, I could not. I couldn't do I had to train by myself, and I was doing more dog crap. I, I moved so far from away the- from powerlifting, <laughs> you could not move any further away unless I was doing Zumba. <laughs> You know, so it was like dieting, getting lean, doing dog crap training. And I would do that in a day. And every, every, every now and again, I would go in at night and I would do my cardio bike stuff. And I'd watch him working with a small group of guys that were in there. And they were, they were making progress and they were getting better. And I'm trying to figure out, like, what the hell is this? And he doesn't know what I'm trying to figure out. But then again, I don't even know what the fuck I'm watching in the first place because it didn't all kind of come together. And then after probably about 24, 18 to 24 months. And it was this stupid AMRAP shit that he was doing. It was like, this fucking guy just did his max for eight reps. Yeah. Or this this lady just yeah. did 50 pounds over for fucking eight reps. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? And that's when you were writing you know, some of the other manuals. And I think it was the training templates manual. And you started to get a lot of questions about yeah. the 531. And you said, look, I think, you know, I'm going to write this. I'm like, fucking do it. But just do the very best that you can do. Because I'm not going to say I thought it was going to be a knock and a, that it was going to be a great. Dave, I had no fucking clue. No, I, no, I, don't no, think, I don't think people understand that I had no master plan. No, no, we didn't because it was just, it funneled down. I mean, it started out as we were just giving away ebooks for free products. Like, hey, buy a t-shirt. We'll give you a yeah. book. It takes us no time to put the book together. And the first one was like training templates. The first then, one was the band manual. Yeah, the man, band manual. I was talking to Tracy about that. She's like, yeah, you know what? I think I, I think we're like, redoing it right now. <laughs> and then the, uh, then it was. Uh, it was the band manual. Then it was like training templates. And then there was uh, Max. Tra- effort, training three seven, days a week. week. Yeah, that was the first one. And then I was like, you know what? What, it, what was a weird realization was uh, after all the fuck ups I had was when we had kids people coming in kind of untrained or, you know, they hadn't been lifting for a while. Yes, they were not good athletes. And I was like, listen, we're just going to, let's just get your your shit going a little bit. And all of a sudden, after eight months, they were pulling or deadlift. Everything was better than they ever were. And I was like, man, we didn't even train fucking heavy. And people need to understand the book wasn't being written at this time. It wasn't even a Started in 2007, and I wrote it in 2000. (laughs) nine i think yeah so it wasn't even conceptualized it's yeah. just like i want to try to figure out how to help these kids get, and you were trying to get stronger yourself because yeah. you want to bring your own raw strength back yep. up and um th- so it didn't just there was like no strategic it was like yeah okay i think i do remember having a conversation where i said i think this one might sell but for us a good seller back then was like 50 bucks so like, i think this one might do well so you might want to like not put the upside down crosses inside the book. I actually um, had a uh, had uh, Ken do the cover. Yeah, and, and put a real cover together yeah. with this, and put a little bit more time. And fortunately, and fortunately, and not for Jim, but for the the people who used the program, it took off, and it took off in all different segments. And it it was great at the, it's still great because it's, the longevity proves the success because it's simple and it's easy. You know, I still don't know if I like the AMRAP shit, but I can't complain. It's been fucking going on for, what, 25 years? Yeah. And, you know, your your books that have proceeded have had, you know, variants and so oh, forth it's... from there. But it, was, it wasn't like this thing that it was just going to pop and happen and, you know. I, I had uh, no clue. And uh, I'm very thankful. You know, it's, 
you know, people say it took, it took you two years, about two years. And I'm like, man, there's a lot of work went into that prior. We always talk about that. All those. They, things, I so. can validate that though. Cause I saw it, you know, yeah. I saw you working with all those kids. <laughs> I saw all that time going into that. And then, you know, the, the, the time of you actually writing this, I don't, the problem I ran into as a business owner is after that happened, everybody who wanted to become part of the team <laughs> thought they were going to put out the next five, three, one. And it's like, you know, it used to be so easy. We'd sit down and say, Hey, this is a good dude. Yeah. Let's ask around. Who's he know? Yeah. That's good. He's got the right values. Let's put them on. Then it was like, Oh, wait a minute. This motherfucker wants to write a book. Nah, fuck him. Yeah. And it was, it was the wrong reason. You know, they, and they, they forgot the thousands and millions of questions yeah. and all the other stuff that went into it. I think with, uh, you know, just with, uh, you know, for coaching or even with what you do online at some point, well, things should happen organically. Um, I think people understand when you're trying to push something or you're trying to come out, you know, too quick out of the gates. And, uh, I think you and I had developed enough street cred to be like, listen, like, you know, you can trust us, but you know how long it took to earn that trust? Yeah. And you know, none of the sales copy was ever good. You know, so no, I, I, was, I, I, it was just I, like, I released all, but my, the last book I released, I didn't even have a, uh, I just put it up like, Hey, books up. Yeah. Literally I, I, a thing on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. I really think that the first, the first big round of five, three, one was sold as people just saying, thank you for yeah, answering yeah, yeah, my yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. And then they used it and was like, holy shit, yeah. this really works. And then started stealing it and posting it yeah. everywhere. But anyhow, you know, that's the whole other dirty end of the story. Nobody ever wants to hear about. Yeah. That's why we don't do eBooks anymore. Yeah. Uh, with the new, new releases. Uh, the, <clears throat> the other thing that I, I was really, so I, I felt like I was very successful at, you know, I'm not at doing what I was doing. I was doing pretty well. Um, but when I started coaching, I was like, man, I knew the program work cause I've seen it work, but I'm like, can I actually apply this? And I'm like, man, this is, you know, how nerve wracking that was like, I'm putting my balls to the grind. Like, you know, it's my reputation. And so, and I've seen it, other coaches use it, but now you know how it is. Like they don't know the program like I do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like it's my kid. So I know every, all the little stuff that goes in there. And, uh, so it's, it's very validating for me on a professional and personal level to see our kids make so much progress, uh, not just in the weight room, but on the field, which obviously is the most important thing. And I feel like, you know, all that shit that I've done over the years, all the, the work is I'm like, man, it's finally, like, I feel validated in a way. And, you know, people can say whatever they want, this and that, but I'm like, you know what, we're good. We're a good team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you want to say? You know, and uh, you know, it's, I, I was laughing the other day when someone asked me a question. I'm like, "Listen, there's uh, what did I say? Uh, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I just know that I'm right." <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it was the fucking biggest dickhead thing to say. <laughs> Listen, I'm not telling you you're wrong, but I know that I'm right. Uh, and I, uh, and I, you know, there's a million. There's so many great coaches that do a good job. I'm not. Um, and the funny thing is, is even if we took something, uh, whatever different trying to kind of training program, whatever it is, I would apply those same five principles I apply because people get wrapped up a little bit too much in the sets and reps and stuff. Instead of the principles, I could take any program. I can just apply my principles and they're going to be okay. And I wish people would understand that a little bit more because my God, does it make a difference? And, uh, you know, it's when I, uh, when you put up some of the, the uh, highlights of the video of the presentation. Some people are like, "Man, what a jip!" They didn't even show the program. I'm like, did you not hear anything I said? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like go back, rewind. Like, That's it, it's not the program, buddy. I mean, there's obviously certain elements of the program uh, that, but it's nothing. It's not like I'm uh, doing barbell squats with the bar on our head. Like that's the secret, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got to tilt the bar a little bit on your head, put it on your ear. <laughs> So, uh, I'm just very thankful, you know, that, uh, on every level, you know, I, I don't want to say I'm content and I think you don't want to say that either, but, uh, to think of the, probably one of the, me, you, Mark Bell, we're able to do this and be okay. 
you know, we have different levels of success. My version of success is going to be different than yours and Mark Bell's. Well, you got uh, Spud. I mean, there's a, there's a yeah, whole bunch of I, I, others, yeah. too. But it's just like, man, I'm, you know, I'm able to pay my bills. I'm able to live very, very frugally. I don't, like, we bought our truck. We, we, we didn't have, we had one truck for uh, three years. You know, we had one vehicle. That's why I, I was in such good cardiac shape because I just yeah. walked everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we, you know, it's. <clears throat> from a stress point of view, like we don't ever buy anything we can't afford. We can't buy outright. Um, you have no idea what that's like, how much easier that is on you. Like the stress just goes down. Oh, yeah. I do. I do. Yeah. You know, yeah, I just don't need it. You know? you know, before we, before we step out of the whole five, three, what five, three, one realm, the, the one thing with that, see, when I look back on that, it's a completely different story than when you look back on it. And when other people look back on it, because for me, when it was all said and done, it was probably one of the best business learning experiences I ever had in my life. Okay. Because I learned from that to not take my staff for granted, you know, and... Yeah. And there, I mean, there's a lot that went on with that. Yeah. That had I not changed, you know, after that... Yeah. We wouldn't be sitting at this table right now. Yeah. We would hate each other. And because of that, I have somebody that I know I can call no matter how bad anything ever is. You got it, Dave. That will be I in love my you, door. Buddy. So that that's one of the biggest takeaways for me from the 531 because I wouldn't have changed. You knew me. Yeah. I was on no fucking route of even being on a curve <laughs> until <laughs> that happened. But yeah. then it was like, oh fuck. You know, and then you know, we sat down, we talked and it was it was a it was a Well, thank you, Ben. It was a yeah. great experience that you know, worked out extremely well for, for everybody, yeah. you know, and why well, I think, uh, you know, and not only that, it's worked out extremely well for every employee I've ever had since you. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, I, when I walked in here, I can't tell you how much fucking pride I felt. You should. Uh, and uh, this, the fucking front desk is what, you know, how awesome that thing looks <laughs> <laughs> and the fucking things are made out of racks, the offices, and I just, I was like, wow, you know, and I, I, I guess maybe I'm at the age or whatever. Like, I don't ever feel jealousy. I want people to be, I want you to be successful. Like, this is what you wanted, man. Uh, and I, I know part of you loves the old days when we were in that fucking horrible office on 122. I, I enjoyed it too. Uh, you can't go back in the past, and you know that was fucking. No, up. but we can talk about your bathroom. We have yeah. to talk about. The well, bathroom. that's what Tracy showed me your fucking bathroom. I was like, <laughs> motherfuckers, you have no idea what. Yeah. I used to shit with, with like a fucking Bible holding. Like, oh, something doesn't crawl. We and we, die. we we had when we, when we expanded from one building to two, which was just big like, time, baby. That's just not knocked gonna... out. A, literally knocked out part of a wall. <laughs> knocked out Fuck a it. wall. <laughs> there, Jim overtook the bathroom on the other side. First of all, that bathroom was fucking disgusting. And, Am I right? Oh, it was bad. I scrubbed that floor on my hands and knees like it was disgusting. It was black. There was shit oh, in there God. I didn't know. And then I just started hanging fucked up pictures in there. Because <laughs> I wanted a place I could shit. <laughs> Nobody I, went over there, man. And for some reason, I had to go over there one day. It was like a year later, and there was like fucking eyeballs and shit. Cut out like, like some psycho, psychopathic I want, killer. I want people to watch me shit, man. <laughs> like fucking... Admire my duke. <laughs> But it was, it was, uh, but I, I got, I, cause that thing was there for <laughs> probably a couple, six months before I'm like, man, no one's using this thing. <laughs> no. Fucking, I'm going to make this my own. Like this would be my throne. Every man needs a good place to shit. And that's like, if I ever built my own home, <laughs> all my bathrooms would have, uh, uh, soundproof. Yeah. So not only can not everyone hear me do the fucking business, I don't want to hear anyone fucking, <laughs> yeah, I want my, my place, my, what is what does Superman have? His Fortress of Solitude. <laughs> I love dumping, dude. And now that I got reading glasses, I can read my fucking magazines. Fucking in peace. And you, you got kids. That's the only place you can oh, go. I know, I know, uh, I know. Everyone, like shut up! <laughs> and here's like a fucking gas station, man. It's like three fucking... It's all side yeah. by side. You're in there taking a shit. Somebody comes <laughs> in. And there's two shoes sitting right next to you. It's like, no, I can't. This is over. It's the only way you can... Do, uh, that's why... Uh, airports are awesome. They're so anonymous. That's when you fucking blow it up. For weeks, you hold that in. You know, you only let what you need to go out. And then <laughs> when you're sitting in the fucking L.A. airport. 
Oh, God, I can tell some stories on that one. We went on one trip, and Jim took his belt off before going through the metal detector. This was before he had to. And I'm like, what the fuck is he doing? I I don't get this. And then um, goes in, takes a dump or whatever it was, and puts his belt back on outside his pants because his his problem – no, you had to take the belt off. Yeah. So you didn't – you didn't put it back on, so I couldn't figure out why in the fuck's you not putting it back on. You go in the bathroom, take your pants off, <laughs> thread your belt back through your pants, and then yep. put your pants back. And I'm like, this is fucking genius. You don't have to sit there and like reach no. behind your back and get a lat crap. That's, you, that's why I like traveling with people. I'm like, dude, you hit my fucking belt back there for me. <laughs> my son, like Mason, come on, buddy. Oh, no. <laughs> dude, I just, I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Dude, I just got molested. Dude, have you been through TSA? They grabbed your fucking nuts now. <laughs> no. They grabbed my nuts now. I'm like, what? Like, do I really fit the fucking profile, asshole? I, be, I get searched every fucking time. Not only searched, but uh, wanded. Mm-hmm. Every fucking time I go through now. Every time. I got a hip card. I, oh. I pull out my hip replacement card. You know, I see my luggage gets, <laughs> all my shit gets, uh, you know. Uh, how, many, how many people have TSA fucking caught? Zero. <laughs> it's a violation of our fourth amendment illegal search and seizure anyway what else you got <laughs> yeah let's talk about income tax and how that's fucking illegal oh, fuck that. <laughs> I, you, you, I gotta uh, pay my own twice uh what i'm an employee I'm oh an yeah owner so, and employee. yeah i gotta do that too yeah i think that's some shit yeah. payroll Social Security twice. That's yep. fucking unbelievable. Yeah, I got I got to pay myself unemployment or whatever, which you'll never fucking get. <laughs> I know. I'm gonna fire myself, motherfucker. I don't think we. I, I actually, and I could be wrong. I don't think if you're an employer, you can qualify for unemployment. I'm pretty sure you can't. You sure I, as fuck can pay into it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. How bad is your eyesight? Because I thought it would be kind of funny and cool to have him hold the phone and pick. There's a lot of nonsense. Ones I could, I could, I could, really I could, I'll make it out. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of ones that would be one sentence and he could just kind of skim through them. So just scroll it up. All right. It's, okay. Holy shit. Okay. Uh, thoughts on Larry Wheels? Uh, I just know he's a good lifter. I don't really know anything about him. He's fucking strong. Dave, I'm a huge fan of you, and the guests... Oh, here I am on... Right there. Uh, I'm a 20-year... 20-year-old in college. What are your ideas on majoring in exercise science or something that's related? That's a college discussion. Yeah. Actually, let... let, Set the phone down. Let Jim and I have a talk on this one, because he comes from... uh, very from a very exercise science well no but you come from a very high your, your parents were both teachers yes and we're running into a really weird time with college education as far as say you go into exercise science by the time you pour all that money into that degree you're never going to be able to get back out which you know not even close so that and now if you need a master's to be a strength coach the odds of you ever being able to even pay back your student loans means you're going to be one of 10 people in the industry yeah who are able to pull that much income i didn't even think about the uh so i mean yeah the i mean unless there's a scholarship if my advice is if you're bust your ass get the best grade you can in high school try to get the scholarships whatever you can to be able to grant grants to knock it down but if you got to pull a loan for the full thing this isn't like when i went to school and i could work two three jobs to pay for everything yeah pay for you could pay you in the summer yeah, I mean, I walked yeah, away with zero student debt, yep. so I can say, yes, my degree was worth it. It took me longer than everybody else, but it was definitely worth it. But I'm not sitting on $100,000 worth of debt looking at a job that may only pay me twenty seven grand. Yeah. Uh, the only thing, uh, <clears throat> if you can somehow get credits outside of a college, like a junior college, and then get them transferred. There's um, an idea. The only thing that I... I you know, with the exercise science is, uh, have you ever said it? You've said, yeah, you were, what's your, what was your major? Exercise science and nutrition. Like, did they know anything, Dave? No. I mean, nutrition, I don't want to, I took a lot of nutritional biochem. So yes, I did learn stuff there. What I'm, what I'm, what I'm trying to practically say. Practically, no. W- would you, if, if a kid just got whatever major and found ways of interning, got his foot in the door, right, of whatever major, 
got his foot in the door at a local college or something and then ended up getting a GA there. Now your master's is paid off. The internship is going to be worth more than the fucking degree. If the internship is under somebody that yeah. teaches you how to do your own research. So you need to, now we're in a world well, where you have to vet information. Yes, yes. Now, like 99% of what, 100% of everything that you and I have learned has not been in the classroom. Correct. 100. Correct. But now we got... 90% of all the information on social media, YouTube, yeah. WordPress, oh, everything else. Oh, I see what else. you're saying. It's, sorry, it's whether the information's worthwhile. It's being junk, but my kids don't know how to disseminate between yeah. what they're finding on YouTube or what they're finding that's, elsewhere. That's why you have you intern. And, you, they uh, have to have somebody that knows how to teach yeah. them. It's more than just learning how to Google. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's where the intern comes in, and that's where, uh, and that's where your own training comes in. Yes. And... Uh, even when I was, uh, coaching at Kentucky, I was training people outside of it. So it was like this constant process of, uh, and it, it wasn't because I wanted to learn. It was because this is what I love to do. <laughs> that makes sense to you. I was yeah. like, Oh, fucking train you. Yeah. I don't give a shit. You know, you pay me whatever. It doesn't have to be much. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if the exercise science degree, like you said, is going to be worth it in the end because of all the, the money. I think you Nothing is going to replace in any field, hands-on and networking. They have. To, that's true because with the staff that we hire, I'm not going to say we don't look at the resumes, but it's what we look at. I last. never. I never. I have never in my life given a resume. Yeah, I've only. Hey, do you even know if I graduated college? All you have is my fucking word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did it matter? Well, at the time, no. No. No, because, and that was, yeah. I, I knew you could fill the role that we were looking for better than anybody else that was out there. And, but with the people that we bring in now, you know, it's pretty easy saying we had to, you know, replace a customer service. Rhonda's been here forever. Yes. So she's still here. She'll, I love her to death, but she needs an assistant. So we had to bring in another assistant for her. And, um, you know, within five minutes of speaking to this person, is this is going to work or not. Yep. Just from a personality yeah. standpoint, I don't know where she went to school. I don't even know if she graduated high school. I, I don't fucking care. I care about how she treats that customer on the other end of the line. You know, and, you know. Jay Yellow was saying that as well about his. Yeah. His I mean, I, I kind of know Josh's degree because we really had to have somebody that knows film. Yeah. So I was like, fuck, we better find nobody. Because how, I don't know. It. Here's, here's, here's where it matters. When the person hiring doesn't have a fucking clue. Well, that's, that's the, um, <laughs> that's, uh, I was watching something on YouTube the other day about, uh, top 10 things millionaires do or something. And they, they do a really good job of, uh, animating while they yeah, talk. Yeah. So it's like a fun video and my son kind of likes it. And it's like the value is I'm like, okay, wake up early, get your shit done. And then I watched something that that company did on the only three exercises you need. I was like, they're fucking horrible. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wait a minute. Everything I was saying, cause I don't know what the top 10 things for millionaires are. Yeah. I mean, I guess I kind of do, but you know what I'm saying? And I was like, eh, maybe you're fucking lying about everything else. Like, I don't know enough about film to know, like, hey, you're full of shit, dude. Yeah. Because there's always, there's always going to be a five through one dude <clears throat> uh, who can uh, understand, explain things fairly easy and gets everything. Does that make sense? Yes. A ne always, network. Yeah. Just exactly what you said. And, uh, but I don't know. I don't know enough. Like, maybe he's the guy. Maybe you just fucking uh, hired John Davies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Yes. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's where yeah. it starts getting hairy. And then, uh, see, I like the millionaire stuff because it's like, dude, go ahead and go to bed at eight 30 at night, go to bed at nine o'clock at night. Cause I'm going to start working at 11 because all the real evil shit comes out after midnight. Yeah. All the kids go home when the lights go on. Yeah. I start working when the lights go off. So when yeah. you wake up early in the morning, my shit's already done. So you're not getting the jump on me, motherfucker. Well, that's, that was a, someone <laughs> asked me one time is, uh, like, what time do you wake up? I'm like, I wake up when my eyes open. That's like, when I get up. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't have this, uh, you know, for years I would wake up, uh, especially when I was a kid, all through junior high and high school, I was always up early. Then when I went to the Air Force Academy, I was up early. And then I was like, you know what's awesome, Dave? It's fucking sleeping. <laughs> and I'll never forget uh, John Meadows, his first day that after he quit his job, his first day he woke up without an alarm. He's like, dude, I felt so good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I just wake up when I wake up, which is not very late. But the good thing is if I can't sleep that night, I can sleep. Well, here's the thing, and too, I, is you, I, you're, you're, you're creative. 
your yeah. work is creative. So you could be laying there watching Netflix at nine and be like, oh, fuck. Yeah. And now you're you're on a roll until 2.30 in the morning, but what, fuck, you're supposed to go to yeah. bed at nine to get up at six? <laughs> so I get some shit done at 4.30? <laughs> yeah. Drinking coffee? Uh, uh, I can't read a fucking thing on here, dude. My eyesight's so bad. No. Yeah, I apologize. No, uh, try those. You're the... Uh, See if those help you. Are those... Uh, 2.5. Ooh. Should be like a magnifying glass. Let's see these bad boys. I'm going to lose... Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, Jim, check out... Okay. Uh, sucks being old. Eh, I'm okay with it. Uh, show me your friends and I will show you where you're going on in life. Where you're, where you're going in life. That's bullshit. How do you feel about <laughs> Brett Contreras putting down your lifting method, methods? I don't give a fuck. Uh, why would I care? <laughs> we averaged 470 yards a game rushing, by the way. Give a fuck. Uh, okay, I uh, got a newborn daughter, eight weeks now. And trying to find time to train is very hard. Max of three days a week. My strength is clearly t- uh, down. Any tips to make gains with the lack of sleep and time to train? What do you think, Dave? Take a four-day program. Divide it over eight days. Yeah. I think people really overthink this stuff. The other thing is, like I tell everyone, is uh, <laughs> make your wife breastfeed so you don't have to do anything. <laughs> I tell everyone that. There you go. <laughs> That works. Uh, and do what you can do. do yeah. That's, it's, uh, and, you know, get your sleep when you can because <clears throat> sleep at this point is probably a little more important than training. So I'd rather have them sleep a little extra and do a little less in the weight room at this point because you're not going to do anyone any good exhausted. Yes. Uh, holy cow. Okay. Is it necessary? Is, it, is going all in necessary to get an important type of perspective on life? Uh, what do you think, Dave? I got, I'm going to say yes, but it's conditional on responsibilities. And I want to say it's conditional on age, but that's not necessarily true. You know, if you're, you know, 18 to 24, 18 to 25, you don't really have a whole lot to lose. Yep. And you, you, you can thing. go, you can, then you can really go at it. And it's still going all in as far more than what most people think it is. When you yes. really, the problem is when you start to go all in and then you become addicted to it like I was. And then slowly things come into your life that you can lose, but you don't give a fuck if you lose them yes. or not. It's like being an addict. Yeah, that's, that's where it becomes a problem. But I do think the only way you're going to ever know if you've gone too far is to go too far. Yeah, it's, it's you, like if people ask, like, uh, leave one or two reps in the bank. Well, you got to know where you fell, fall off before yeah. you know where, like, listen, I know I got two more reps. So you have to fail a little bit. You yes. have to fall off the edge a little bit. And don't go all into anything you're not passionate about. I know passion is a word that gets thrown off, you know, all over the place and redefined all different ways. But the way I put that is if you're going all in on something and you're at your breaking point and there's nothing else left and you still got to take one more step, work one more hour, do one more thing, the only thing that's going to get you there is the passion for what you're doing. Yes. Everything else will be justified away. Yeah. That's how our brain works. <laughs> like, I got to sleep, you know, everything yeah. else. But that passion is like, fuck this, I'll do it, I'll figure it out later. Um, so otherwise, you're just not going to be able to do it. Yeah, I think is, is, is going all in necessary to get an important type of perspective on life. I think for the majority of people on this, especially in this country, there's not a lot of hardship. So I don't, I think you need to <clears throat> put your eggs all in one basket and really go for something. I think when you're dealing with some people, maybe a hundred years ago where life was fucking tough, you didn't need to get that because your perspective was, fuck, I'm cold. I have to chop wood. Yeah. Hardships kind of been redefined. I think, yes. that, you know, one of the questions was asking us, you know, what do we think about the kids today or the parents of the kids today? And, you know, it's, it's going to fall back into the same thing of what did our parents think of us? You know, it kind of rolls downhill, but, yep. you know, the kids today don't have 
first off, you're making a huge assumption that they're all a bunch of pussies to begin with. A huge assumption. That was my big realization when I got there. Because that's not true. The other thing is they are dealing with things you never had to deal with. Yep. You didn't have to. I mean, we had. To, I had to deal with being bullied as a kid. All right, what five kids making here's fun the, of me? Here's the thing: me is up. you got bullied <clears throat> personally. You, yeah, but when you went home, it was fine. Gone. Yes. Now it's twenty four seven. It's text. It's all yeah. this other. So they're dealing with things that we really can't comprehend. So resilience is something that every parent should be teaching their children. And who to really give a fuck about listening to? I yep. think that a lot of times they care too much about other people's opinions that don't matter. Well, the, the uh, I think that's always been the case in a way. Yes. But I think with the social media, it's, it's a different world, uh, way different world. However, the same ideas. Like, you know, people say, like, uh, I tell my son, stay the fuck off social media. He's like, I don't have, he doesn't have Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, nothing. I'm like, good, stay off it as much as possible because it, it will bring you nothing but harm. At this point, you're not selling anything, right? No one gives a fuck what you're wearing today. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very narcissistic thing, and then it just becomes this is addictive. You know, how many times uh, I was in the airport the other day, I, I didn't see anyone doing anything other than looking at their phone. I was just looking around. It's like, I'm not looking at my phone. <laughs> I just want to enjoy my uh, just watching people. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I don't, want, I don't want to throw out a Bible card, but it is the first motivational book ever written. Yeah. Virtues still matter. Yeah. Ten commandments still matter. Yep. All those things still matter. You know, so if people just went and lived, you know, according to those, you yeah. know, it it's solves just, just yeah, it, it uh and it the the Ten Commandments didn't just uh are not just central to Christianity. For the most part, people will agree, like, you know what, we probably yeah. shouldn't kill each other. We down with that? All right, put <laughs> yeah. your hand in there. All right, good. Yeah, everybody is. Uh you know, that's obviously some of them are a little more religious oriented, but I mean, they didn't just come from a rock. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, him and Moses. Uh, I, I just, the, there's some basic tenets of life. What? Yeah, the basic tenets of life. Yeah. If you're going to live like in a civilized society, like I always hear people, I don't trust anyone. Well, you better not fucking drive because you're trusting that asshole to stay on the right side of the road when you're on the right side of the road. Mm-hmm. Right? Does that make sense? So I mean, we have a tremendous amount of trust. And that's, you know, in a civilized society, you don't all have to agree on a, some of the smaller stuff, but the big stuff. Uh, and, and, and the other thing is, you know, I, I watched this, I think I probably mentioned this before. I watched this great documentary called The, uh, the Other F Word. It's about fatherhood. Mm-hmm. And it talked to, to punk and hardcore musicians who now have kids. So at the beginning of their life or, you know, when they were huge, they were anti-authority, fuck the people, fuck the police. And now they are the, the, the authority. So how do you wrestle with that? And this guy had this great quote. He said, you know, for all these years, I thought I was changing the world with my lyrics. And I realized it's all bullshit. Uh, I'm probably paraphrasing. He goes, then I had kids and I realized the only way you're going to change the world is just raise good kids. So I have this thing. You know, I said, listen, if you want to really change the world, raise good kids. If you don't have kids, coach, teacher, or mentor. And if you don't want to do any of those things, keep your fucking hands off. Them. And, uh, so at this point in my life, I'm like, listen, I got my family. I have the kids at my school that I, you know, at the London high school, that I try to help out as much as I can. And after that, you know, uh, I, I can't control everything. And uh, so I see all these people screaming and crying and yelling and screaming. I'm like, you're not doing anything. Fucking take care of your shit, man. Take care of your, you know. And another thing, you know, talk about values and stuff. I always think it's important to give back, just like you guys have. I can't Live, read learn, it. Pass on. Pass on. Everywhere. I think it's financially I'm able to to give back to my community. I'm not rich, but I we live simply enough where I, I don't have to work 12 hours a day. And I did that on purpose. So I'm like, you know, I, my, when I, the opportunity came up when Matt Goodwin asked me, selfishly, I was like, no, nah, man, I'm fucking like my time alone. And I was like, what kind of person am I am that tells people they need to give back, but I'm not willing to do the same thing? So <clears throat> it's been the most rewarding thing I've ever done. I don't get paid. Uh, and I just think, uh, so I, I put my money where my mouth is and I wonder how many people are elected leaders, AKA servants are really doing that. And that's why, like, as soon as someone proposes something, I'm like, well, are you doing it? Mm-hmm. You fucking doing it? No. All right. Well then you, I know they're fucking frauds. 
And it's just, and I'm not saying I feel superior. I feel better because I know I'm doing what I stand up for. And it validates that you're giving back for the right reasons. Yeah. Where a lot of people are giving back for financial reasons, yeah. political reasons, you know. Well, I, I want, like, dude, this, it's awesome. Like, walking around town and people are like, thanks, man. I appreciate yeah. what you're doing. I'm like, you know, I'm glad to help. Thank you. And uh, so it's been, it's been nice. But I, I just, it was a big thing. Uh, is, is putting my values to a test and I and I want you know I faltered a little bit for you know first couple of days I was like you know it's a lot of time you know it's a lot of time and uh, I was like you know I, I have to be the, I have to stand up for what I believe in and uh, I was like fuck it let's do it and uh, so but yeah uh, as I told you before the, the first time I saw you on the side like coaching this is when you were coaching and not you were yeah, yeah, doing yeah. both after all the years I've ever seen you, every situation I've ever seen you in, that was the best place I've ever seen you. Yeah, be. I am the happiest I've been. It was, and, and uh, I kind of, I'm where I should be. And it's funny because uh, you know, you and I did all these different stuff. We go to all these big schools and talk to all these different things, and and I'm like, you know what, high school, and it's the last place I think you can make a really good impression. Right. Think about yes. the the guys you had helping you out in the weight room when you were high, high school. High school's the last spot. Junior yeah. high, I think, is the most yeah important. Yeah, but you still got a shot at high school. Yeah, you still got. Like you said, it's your last chance. Yeah, and I I had my greatest memories from you know, uh, not my greatest memories, my greatest learning I had happened in high school, and that's when you can really like you send them off to college. It's like, well, you know. <laughs> We, I gave you something. Hopefully, this can plant the seed. And it's not just about getting bigger and stronger and all that bullshit. Um, you know, even doing the little things right. You know, you talk about carrying over. Holy shit, does that matter? Um, so, uh, now working from home and working with Juliet. Do you have you guys hired anybody to help you? Oh yeah. So is there somebody in the house now? No, 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 no. Just this, fulfillment. Uh, well, we have yeah, definitely have fulfillment. We got rid of that a long time. Okay. Ago. Uh, and then we hired design companies. We just uh, um, she would be able to tell you a lot more than this. I mean, obviously we have outside accountant and someone who does all that stuff. And then we have design. We just hired this past year because of the tax breaks. Yes. Uh, we invested every cent that we got from the tax breaks, and it was massive. I told you, we went from 41% 40, to 20% tax rate. We were getting fucking raped by the federal government. Well, you can't afford to do things. I mean, we, we get hit the same way. Yeah. There's so many things you, you want to do, but you can't afford yeah, because, to do Yeah, because they need a new fucking car. Yeah. Uh, and God forbid you actually. So now we are. And then we did something with uh, and, you know SEO bullshit and all this other stuff. Uh, some of them worked out. Some of them didn't work out. You know, whatever. We didn't know. Uh, so then we have, an, you know, I think we have three or four, I don't know, like when I first started and when Ken first started, yeah. kind of like that. We hire separate companies that are not yeah. technically employed by us. I can't remember what the exact, you know, how you. Kind of like permanent non-legal permanent yeah contract yeah so it's it was yeah um but it's been wonderful for us because it gives not not everything falls on her and i anymore yes and they do they do their better job better than i would like i don't know i can, I can only come up with so many like imagine if me and you just had to think up t-shirt designs oh i like know. just put a circle on there well, we know. did make for it a, a square while. this time yeah. fuck yeah <laughs> So how has it changed the dynamic? Because there's a lot of people who are going to be watching this that have home-based businesses. And you're kind of, you don't know it, but you're like at the brink of almost not being a home-based business anymore. It's, it's, yeah. it's getting close, maybe a few years. But you do have the ability to now, as technology increases, to not have that happen, you know, to keep it there. Yeah. But your dynamic between you, her and yourself has had to have changed. Uh, you bring other people yeah, in. Well, when when we first started, it, I was doing most of everything, all the, and then I realized because she had run a business for so many years and very successful at the gym, she said, "Well, let me help out." And I was like, "All right, you sure? Like, you know, you sure you want to do this?" And uh, so she basically does all the the business side. I handle all the. Um, I call myself the talent. I'm like, I don't know anything about that. You know, she handles the scheduling of all the stuff uh, for the most part. Um, except when Dave calls, he, he actually got my phone number, <laughs> but I don't answer my emails anymore. Like I don't do any of that stuff. Uh, and I know it sounds like a dickhead thing to do, but I just, I don't, 
I don't like checking my emails. I don't know. There's just I want to be. I don't really check Instagram or Facebook. That just feels like it's a. Uh, and it has nothing to do with me being a dick. It's just like I don't. It's like a soul sucking experience being on a social media, and uh, so everything gets funneled to her, and then we work stuff out. Uh, but it is, the, the most important thing is we're able to separate business from personal. So we work at X amount of part of the day, and then after that, it's for the most part it's done, and it hasn't affected our private life at all. Um, and part of it is we live so far below our means that we can handle some stress. And part of it is we never take off more than we can chew, uh, which, you know, again, you talk about taking risks. It's like, well, our risk is, is this going to add more fucking stress to my life mm-hmm. That's that I'm not willing to deal with? And that's uh, – so we're never going to we, – we could easily grow bigger, but at what cost to me and my wife? Like, I don't want to not be her best friend anymore. It's a big cost. And I just – like I, just want, I don't care. Like, I'll just make less money, you know? And it, Ellen Cosgrove said something to me. Talk about having perspective on life is he said something to me. He's like, you know, everyone's asking, how can I make more money? He goes, I'm figuring out a way to make the same amount by doing less. <laughs> and, I, and it's not about that. It's about, you know, maybe we should redefine how we're looking at stuff. Uh, and we had, I think the last two years have been just fucking massive for us. And part of it is we're getting better with all the business bullshit. And part of it is we're spending less. And, uh, you know, we have our, our roles, I think, a little better defined. Um, so, uh, I don't, I, I think the, the one thing my wife and I have is, uh, we are both divorced. And so I think after the divorce is we kind of knew what we were looking for. And like, well, I've been with her for nine years now. I've never fought with her one time because I'm like, we always like, because my house, besides we work there, like that's just my, that's my sanctuary. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want my sanctuary to be fucking horrible. So we're like, you know, is this really that big of a deal? I'm like, yeah, you know, let's just work this out. And to, to her credit, she's the one that, you know, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll let you, you know, she's the one who's got all the patience and stuff. Uh, but if she was, <clears throat> if I'm married to her, you know, that's that's kind of how we work dynamically. Yes, it wouldn't work if she was always at my throat. Then I would just be at her throat. And then what's the fucking point? So she's the one that's probably a little more mature about. Uh, dealing with me and uh, she's always like listen i'm never she's never nagged me to do anything she's like i know you're not going to do it so what's the fucking point i'm just kidding. yeah then we're just gonna be upset with each other she's like you're just not going to do it she's like you know i'll ask you if you really want to do something you'll say no i'm like all right uh so um but i think that goes you know just having kind of a more it's hard with you know how it is but you work with tracy it's fucking hard man it's hard it's a hard that's why i asked the question because it's a struggle and everybody's struggle is going to be different yeah you know where we're at the point now where we don't have to bring work home yeah you know if i do any work at home it's creative work or if it's work at home it's meetings that we can't have you know while we're here yeah but we we finally got to a point where that wasn't that issue where it was like just 24 and during the startup time where there was no choice you know yeah it that's, was 24 that's, a, that's a little different uh, you know it's but you're able to i mean uh you have other people can do jobs now. yes yes and i think that you know those listening that are just starting a company need to understand you never get away from it no you know, like it's, I, we for three years four years we packaged everything up now i'm t- not just here i'm yeah. talking at home when I, in my house yeah uh you talk about we can't go on vacation Mm-hmm. We couldn't even leave for a weekend to do something. Good mm-hmm. job, Dave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was his penis, by the way. <laughs> uh, he hasn't. He didn't even sit up, <laughs> stand up. Uh, so then, you know, but just having that shit off of our plate, you know, boxing up fifty books every day, and then going to the, uh, you know, I, we did that. The USPS dump them off. It's terrible. Uh, it's a pain in the ass. Uh, and I'm very th- like it was awesome. Because you're like, you know, I got all these orders out, but there goes half your day printing off labels. Nothing that you didn't know before. And I was glad because all the work I did here, I'm like, man, it's fucking easy. Just print off labels. And then now I'm like, eh. yeah, it's like, <laughs> fuck, I gotta do this again. But uh, we, you know, we were going to have to, you know, the way <clears throat> we were going to ha- be able to probably, <clears throat> I should say this, we thought we were going to have to do that again, uh, but we just outsourced again bunch of that shit we outsource everything and uh even for whatever that cost us it's not uh even if we saved 20 grand 
is it worth 20 grand? Well, in the long run, it's going to, I mean, it's kind of a little off topic, but business related. In the long run, it's going to allow you to scale better. Yeah. So you can bring it in to save that 20% or you can keep it fulfilled out yeah. and sell 30% more. Yeah. You know, so it's it's a weird dichotomy because it's sometimes you got to take that hit to be able to move forward. Yeah, that's and, what we did with Amazon and because they, they steadily take a bigger and bigger chunk. My big thing with Amazon was uh, probably what you had to deal with when you first branched off. You were not West. You were not Elite FTS or Dave Tate. You were Louis Simmons West Side. So when we, when you get everything fulfilled by Amazon, now no one goes to your page. Yes. So uh, we just we, we when we release stuff now, we just release on our website for about a year, and then we put it on Amazon. So hey, you want so we have a central hub of where you're going to get our stuff, and I think people get so enamored with Amazon. It's a great thing i mean it's a the biggest online mall in the world but you lose your identity now let's say 10 years down the line amazon decides to jack up the prices Mm -hmm. now what are you going to do now they have full control over everything now you're fucked you have no home base now you have to give them all your money the the bigger thing than that i mean outside of that can put you out of business is as soon as you lose your identity you're done yeah because that's your only competitive advantage yep you know anybody can write a program anybody can write a book anybody can duplicate anything you know but they can't duplicate you no and uh it's just you know we talk about you know when when louis uh passes away west side's done and you know it may hold on for a year or two or someone may try to but it's you know louis is west side barbell yeah. through and through uh and i can't imagine that place without him so you know that's that's where you you know <clears throat> is elite fts bigger than you Mm-hmm. You know, you have to enter. Is it? I don't know. You like the th- you you want to think, but I like I like to think that it is. But the reality is, it's probably even. Yeah. See, uh, like it, you know, I, th- I come to grips with this. Like I thought, you know, it, what- yeah, let, me, let me step back. It, what before social media, I could answer the question easier and say yes, it is. Okay. Because the people associated and the team members had more prominent voices Okay. with the delusion or the, when you dilute, you know, of social media, then all those other voices that used to just scream, here's elite FTS. Yeah. They're stifled because there's so so many other voices that the only voice that's really standing the most prominent is yours is mine. Yeah. You know, so it's now a matter of how to get the other voices to come back up again. Yeah, you know, I, I I wrestled with the the thought of uh, you know every man, woman, and child wrestles with their own mortality, and they, everyone wants to be immortal in some way, right? Does that make sense? Like they want, I want to live on in some way. And I started thinking, I'm like, <clears throat> if my boys don't want anything to do with this, I'd be happy if I never sold another book after I died. You know, as long as does that make sense? Like I don't have this mm-hmm. massive need for immortality because. Just- I always tell people there's only two people everyone knows on this earth. It's Jesus and Hitler. Like, mm-hmm. get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> just don't leave them dead. Yeah. You know, that's, that's it. Just- yeah, I, I just, I don't have this massive need to, to be remembered outside like my wife and my kids. I just, <clears throat> because I know, you know, so many great people have died and lived before, you know, lived and died before me. I mean, I don't know them. I, can you name all the you know presidents, how, Dave? You know how many great people have died that nobody knows yeah. of? Yeah. Okay. And, you, and people want to, this, I went on a rant about this, I don't know, months ago, I get it all confused anymore, about legacy. Like, if I don't give a fuck about my legacy, no. I'm going to be dead. Yep. Well, if I don't, well, here's the thing. When you go to Wikipedia and it says the Middle Ages, it's five paragraphs. You mean people lived and died <laughs> in the Middle Ages? <laughs> right? I mean, it's fucking crazy. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't have this uh, narcissistic idea that I'm going to, this is going to live on. And if it dies when I die, man, I'm fucking cool with it. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't have that legacy. And I think when I, maybe when you first started, maybe like, hey, I passed this to here. And maybe, and you're like, man, you know. I think we all want to try to do something bigger than ourselves. <laughs> and then the older you get and, the more responsibility you get, you see it's like you said, it's, it's more important to be more to the people that you're closer yeah. to. Yeah. I want to, uh, you know, they matter. I, I thought like if, if my books still sell and that gets, you know, pays for vacations for my kids occasionally, I'm like, I fucking do it. I don't give yeah. a shit. I mean, you don't <laughs> want to be, 
you know you don't you don't want to be on your hospital deathbed with a nurse no uh that's why i hope i die before my wife i'm a selfish <laughs> fuck what else you got <laughs> any training stuff Let me see. or something just whacked How to start with 531 after a four year layoff from lifting? I oh my God. That's, I can answer that. I don't even know the program. Well, I kind of do. Just work up, find out what you can kind of do for five or eight reps that you don't fucking shit on, that set that as your training max and go. Okay. The same way you would if you never did it before. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> just figure out, uh, there's, <clears throat> and start light, just follow the principles, man. You'd be surprised at how light our kids lift compared to how strong they are. Uh, here's one more for Jim. You, you, uh, Dave and JL talked about this, but what's right. the biggest uh, lesson that you've learned from Westside in your time there? Uh, Training-wise, definitely. If you don't mind reiterating the question, too. What's that? And if you don't mind reiterating Oh, what is the, the greatest uh, lesson I learned uh, from my time at Westside Barbell? You know, training-wise, it was uh, – <clears throat> maybe said a little more than actually practice would train optimally, not maximally. <laughs> right. It was, uh, something that I think Mel Sif probably, uh, and I don't know if it always went on. It doesn't always have to go on, but in the broad scheme of things, it went on there more than people think, yeah. you know, if you were there, you know, well, there's, there's a, a mystique about the place and then there's the reality about the place. And we just kind of go in we have, you know, when we were lifted, it was fun. Like, it wasn't me, everyone killing each other, right? Imagine fucking, all, most of the time on Fridays, it was fucking laughing. You you suck. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I used to call Dave Bocephus. He'd get mad at me. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't even know why I'm just calling him Bocephus. Everyone call him Bocephus. <laughs> and it was just fucking stupidity. And uh, and so, you know, occasionally, you, and the, the, the thing about lifting with experienced lifters, you could fuck around a lot. When it came time to set, everyone dialed in. We did it. We got up and then called him an asshole. And uh, the, the thing I remember most, not there's a lot of things, but there was a great time when I was with me, JL, and Dave were lifting. And we were, it was Wednesday because we were benching. And then we did dumbbell inclines. And they didn't have a, we did them on a, on a dumbbell decline sit-up bench. And Dave lay down on the bench. He's like, all right, hand me the dumbbells. Or, you know, and JL's like, do you want me to count your reps too? Are you personal? Well, he made, made it seem like he was Dave's personal trainer. And yeah, he, he said, he wouldn't said, fucking do you, let it go. He said, do you want me to show you how I show my clients <laughs> to kick those dumbbells up? But it was one thing after another. Oh, yeah. And just, and so I, I don't remember all the, the trainings per se more so than I remember the, the bullshit that went on and the fun stuff that went on. And, uh, you know, I'll, that's the, what I, I kind of cherish the most. And then it's funny. That's what I remember about football. That's what I remember about most of the stuff. Even with, when I spend time with my boys and stuff, I don't remember all the – you know, just remember the little stuff, the, the fun stuff. Uh, I, hell, just working here, I remember Dave and I boxing stuff up on a Friday after squat day, just me and him. Fucking – there's no air conditioning. Shirt – two shirtless dudes – it was the gayest thing I've ever seen. Harry is. Harry fucking sweaty. It's uh, Friday. We're trying to box it up because I think Tim came around 3 o'clock or so, 2 or th maybe 4, trying to get all the packages out, just sweating all over the cardboard. You know, hope this one's right. <laughs> the receipt's got little drops of <laughs> yeah, water on it. that's what I was saying. The tape's not sticking yeah. because the cardboard's – and that's, that's what I remember most, man. I don't – you know, whatever – like, what about with the weight room? Like, eh, I don't care about it. Like, it was that. That's what I, you know – so, you know, as I'm going through and I'm writing these things on Instagram because people are asking how they can come out here and train. So I'm going through this whole rigmarole, you know, of why I don't want people to come out here and train, you know, or because it's what I, my 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 go to answer is you have to be able to justify why your time's worth more than the time with my wife and kids. Yep. Yeah, right. Good luck. Once you do that, then we can talk. But then I keep adding to it. And the one thing that was going through my mind to add to the next segment was during my entire time at Westside, and this will overlap with some of the time that Jim was there as well, I didn't know the full names. I mean, first off, last, the, my last post I wrote about how far everybody drove. I mean, we are driving, say, from London, so that's 30 minutes. 
And then you had Chicken Hawk driving, yeah, you know, two, two and a half hours. You had, you know, Size Master <laughs> driving two hours. You had um, Bayless driving, you know, an hour and a half. You had uh, Amato driving, you know, an hour. And the list just goes on and on. You had Gritter driving, you know, 45 yep. minutes. And, you know, everybody was driving within an hour and a half, two hours to be able to get to the gym. And while I was putting all this out, I realized, fuck, I didn't know any of these guys' real names. Yeah, everyone had nicknames. It's like Fuzz Dog, Chester, yeah. you know, Big Mike, you know. And, and I remember I had to get some <laughs> some some duck work done in my house because we were taking the heater out. Oh, so you, air. you didn't know it was Jeff Adams? Yeah, I'm like, I'm like fucking who? Gritter does this. So what's, I called Louie. I'm like, what the fuck is Gritter's name? And he said, Gritter. <laughs> I'm like, no, I like, what's this company? I, I want to, I, I need some help. And he didn't know. And I had to call somebody else. Like, I had to call uh, um, uh, Gabe, you know, and there was like five. And then there's Kiana, which was Bob. It's like, then yeah. I realized, holy fuck, I don't know anybody's real name in here. I don't know if they're married. I don't know if they have a girlfriend. Fuck, I don't know if they're gay. I don't know if they're straight. But I know what their squat is. Yeah. I know what their bench is. I know what I, their cues need to be. And I know when we're <laughs> training, it takes about an hour and a half. Yeah. Then I started thinking about, holy fuck, look at all the little petty drama that goes on in every weight room today where everybody's in everybody else's business about little stupid tiny shit that okay. I couldn't get involved in anybody's business because I didn't even know their fucking real name. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, I didn't even know they lived two hours away. I just knew they had 860 squat yep. and they needed five chain per squat side to be able to get to nine. <laughs> you know, and that's the kind of stuff that, you know, I look back on and remember. I'm like, wow, that was kind of fucked up that I didn't know that. But then I look at it and think of that's the genius of Louis Simmons that people don't ever see because he created that environment. Yes. Yeah. Out of a bunch of fucking meatheads that didn't want to listen to a word that he said. And that, that, that's a coach, man. People can say whatever they want. As much as he pissed everybody off, that fucking guy was a coach. Yeah, he's a, he was a – there's a – coaching uh, – he was kind of like uh, Phil Jackson, who was a, you know, a famous basketball coach. He's not – he obviously had to teach some fundamentals here and there, but it's about bringing the people together. Uh, and having them work together that necessarily probably didn't want to be together all the time. That's a great, you know? great comparison. And, uh, of course, now Lou's like, I'm fucking Phil Jackson, motherfucker. <laughs> He's like, fuck all these people. <laughs> Who's Phil want. Jackson? <laughs> yeah. Basketball. Ugh. You know, if they did 100 reps of tricep pushdowns, <laughs> their jump shot would go better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Get them out of the bell squat. <laughs> Do some marching. What else you got? Uh, speaking of West Side... Somebody said, uh, talk about the time you guys met. And Jim and I met? Yeah. And then, uh, Whew, that's a good one. From each other's training, maybe earlier on, because you guys had different Well, I'll, I'll say this. I, when I got at first exposed to, uh, Westside, I obviously read Louie. And, you know, most of his articles pretty much say the same, you know, depending on what he's writing. They're same, you know, he outlined the articles. To me, it was pretty simple, but it wasn't until, Dave was on DeepSquatter.com, like, oh, okay. So you just do a couple of those then. Okay, you do some <laughs> dumbbell work. That's fine. That it, it had made things so much easier for me. So that's my first. So that from that, once I read his Q&A on Burnell, Jason Burnell's old site, uh, it made things much, much easier for me to understand because it was, you know, Louis has, I, I call it, uh, um, you know, like, imagine taking an entire book and you throw all the words against the wall, then you have to stand back and look at it, and the words that mean something need to stand out, but you need to know, know how to decipher that. That's kind of how Louis talks and how Louis writes. If you don't know what you're supposed to be looking for, you, it's just a big jumbled mess. And I think that's especially maybe true now more so than back in the day. But uh, So Dave kind of cleared that up for me. And then, so for, I don't know, maybe, I don't know how long, maybe a year, I, you know, Dave would post sporadically, I think he would send you shit, and then you would send it back, and then he would post it up. And uh, I don't even know if there was any articles up by you. There might have been one or two, but whatever. And then uh, I got to University of Kentucky. I was doing uh, a GA there, and uh, Dave was brought in as a consultant after, I don't know, maybe a year or two. And I, obviously I had known Dave. I was pretty excited about meeting him. And Dave drove down, because it's south, obviously, drove down. 
and like I can only imagine because the amount of shit that I've seen over the years, and you know, he's obviously incredibly suspicious of strength coaches because everyone talks this, and so I think he was finally relieved that someone actually lifted weights <laughs> and wasn't. Uh, so we went out to dinner, and uh, fuck. I mean, I'm sure we talked about a lot of stuff I don't want to talk about at dinner. and uh, <laughs> But I'm sure it had to do with uh, Diana Ball. And, you know, just watching him coach the squat and watching him do the presentation and stuff, uh, it was not – I wanted <clears throat> some of the other, uh, especially Kevin and stuff, I wanted them to learn and stuff. It was really cool. But then, you know, once Dave – Dave was not in coach uh, shape – Coaching shape is different than regular shape is you have eight hours to 12 hours and you have to be coaching sporadically and it starts wearing on you after your second or third group. Well, by the third or fourth group, Dave was basically, you know, dead tired. And so after, if anyone's ever spent time strength coaching, you start to go delirious. And so to make a long story short, Dave, uh, was exhausted and we're all kind of exhausted, but Dave much more so than others. And, Dave goes to sit down in a chair, and my buddy's like, no, 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 no. That's the, that's the phone sex chair. Get up. <laughs> he goes, look underneath, right? There's a piece of tape underneath the chair. I'm like, no, that's, that's the phone sex chair. You don't want to sit in there. That's where we have phone sex. And uh, Dave, what the fuck's wrong with you? you know? And I think, uh, just real quick, I'll explain this. And so I had, you know. Yeah, you might want to. What's that? You might want to explain the, the chair. Well, I'm not going to go because my, my parents <laughs> might watch this. But anyway, but Dave's like, I think at that point, he's like, Jesus Christ, this guy's a little fucking weird. And to be involved in football or powerlifting, you got to be a little fucked up. And, uh, and I didn't do that to impress anyone. It wasn't even me that said it. It was my, the, my, the other assistant coach who's like, dude, no, 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 no. <laughs> and to make a long story short, after that uh, – Dave had asked me to submit some stuff to the Elite FTS at the time. And, you, and I tell people this all the time. I had no idea what was going to happen or anything in my life, but I had already written articles because I knew I wanted to write and I knew I loved training. So, you, you know, you talk about preparation meets opportunity. And Dave's like, yeah, you – and I was like, really? You want some articles? Like, I don't – you know, you know, I'm – so I, I was able to give him shit right away, some articles and stuff right away. And – uh he gave me that opportunity. And I tell people all the time, if, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that when Dave asked, I was ready. And I'm, you know how thankful I am that you asked and that and I, was, I did all the work. And, uh, but then a couple months later, you were hosting the great IPA Nationals, and you asked, like, dude, fuck it. I'm like, I don't know if I should do a meet. And you're like, just fucking do it. So me and Kevin went and did the meet, and after that meet, I was part of the q and I had no idea, you know, and I don't think Dave had any idea either. Uh, no, things just kind of fall into place. Yeah. You know, it's, <clears throat> I've done several consultations. I don't know what you really want to call them, you know, before Jim reached out for this one. And I was always kind of hesitant because it was usually uh, the, the, the majority of them before this were with Louie. So it was just kind of me being a fly on the wall, listening to Louie talk, and then kind of like squaring things up afterwards saying, look, here's a way to make this really, really easy. You know, and then you can look back on what Louis said and see the more complex nature of what's in there. So I'm not going to say I dumbed down what Louis was saying because by no means was I saying everything he was saying. I was just saying the most important parts in the easiest way I could. And usually it would be, you know, speaking to four or five coaches and maybe a couple athletes, and that was about it. This one I go down and me, Jim, and a couple of the other coaches for dinner, I'm like, okay, these guys are kind of like fucking meatheads. This is going to be pretty cool. This is, I like this, man. And then they're like, well, you're going you're gonna to train the guys. And I'm like, wow, that's <laughs> fucking awesome. I get Because I always wanted to be a strength coach. That's what I went to school for. I'm like, fuck, I'll be a strength coach for a day. After the first session, I'm like, holy fuck. Yep, you got five more, buddy. And then, yeah, then they, I thought I was done. And I'm like, well, okay, let's get some lunch and we'll sit down and talk about training. And he's like, no, we got two other groups. Yep. And the first one, I'm like, come on, come on. I'm all, you know, the, by the last one, I'm like, motherfuckers, <laughs> you know, tuck your goddamn elbows, you piece of lazy shit. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's just, I am not, actually, I'm probably more on point than normal. But anyhow, that's when we went back. And as soon as they said that thing about the chair, 
and I knew Jim's background was his his education. I believe his degree is in history or English. English, yeah. And you know his passion is in strength and conditioning, and it, he was a strength coach and he's a walk on Division One football player. So as soon as I heard that, I'm like, I'm going to hire this guy somehow. You know, it's just this is the exact type of person that I need for my company because I have to step out of the training aspect and focus just on how to run a business because I had no clue what I was doing but had to that's a scary thing when training's your whole life you know and that's what you love and that's why you're even in business yeah. and it's like I got to pass this torch on to somebody that knows it has a passion for it and even if it's going to be different it's still going to be quality content it's still going to be good and you know, the humor and everything that came with it was just all kind of a bonus. The work ethic was a bonus. So there are a lot of other things that were a bonus. With you know, the, the funny thing about the humor shit was it was never, ever intended. <clears throat> but you can only, it got to the point where it would be a comp, like you start going a little crazy. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you know, I need to entertain myself a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cause crazy. And uh, the best answer I ever read from David could tell he was, this was back in the deep squatter days was someone asked him how to bench faster he's like just fucking push harder like i was like god that's fucking awesome yeah, I mean, that's a coach right there yeah. i don't know just fucking push harder dude <laughs> but it was like a guy at the end of his rope like fuck yeah. it <laughs> yeah and, that, and then it just started getting uh where things were more personable on our website than any or we were the only real yeah. website but things were not just training related it was like you got to know people a little bit more and it wasn't fake I think a lot of this shit, because uh, you, you saw us, you know, multiple times throughout the day via questions and stuff and articles. I think it's it was a little more real. I didn't, we didn't need to put on a facade no. like I think people do these days a little bit. And I understand because it's social media, but. I don't think we knew how to. No, it's just like, I don't know. Just, there were too many questions, you know, there's too many. And it, it's, don't get, don't get, <laughs> please don't misunderstand. It's not like we sat down at the Q&A and there was 800 Q&As that came in. Some days there'd be like three yep. or four. You know, so it wasn't like this instant thing. It's like all the work would just drive more questions and drive more questions and drive more questions and then more work, more questions, more questions, more work, and kind of like a spinning wheel. And it did allow me to step away and focus on learning how to run a business, which, you know, from, from that standpoint, it sucked. You know, I'm not going to lie to anybody. That part sucked. It took me a long time and a lot of frustration to be able to, grasp that the only way I was going to make a difference in this company was to be able to actually learn how to do this part. And because nobody else was going to care enough about this part than, than I was. That is, yeah. And sure that, baby. that was a big realization. And it's, and I still today still read like an hour of training shit, which I really don't need to, but I still like it. You know, it's still kind of ingrained in there that I like to see, you know, what, what's being reinvented. You know, nothing, nothing's actually really new, but how people put different spins on things yeah. sometimes, especially with the younger generation. Sometimes people will say things a little bit different than you wouldn't think of to be able to get through. That's why I like uh, reading uh, form stuff, the cues. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll fucking use that cue. Yeah. See if that works. And then uh, it has nothing to do with advanced recovery techniques ever. No. <laughs> it's always like... Oh, okay. If you're training them optimally, they're really not going to need a lot no. of advanced, especially kids. No, that's why. But that's that's where I kind of, yeah, uh, with the training stuff. And then, you know what I do? <clears throat> I read the same books over and over and over and over again because I can't get that shit ingrained in my head enough. So people are always like, I read three books. I'm like, well, did you learn anything? Did James you actually Smith told me that. What's that? James Smith told me he's only read three books, and I think there were three of the Russian men. Oh, I'm sure they were Russian. They're probably in Russian, too. <laughs> And that guy, bar none, is one of the most yeah. intelligent people I know when it comes to training. Well, I, I can't, I'm not smart enough to read a book in a week and ingest it all. Like, I need to reread the same stuff over and over again. And there's, you're going to miss something. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, you're going to get stuff ingrained in you, you know. Uh, and I think that's super, super important. And then the other thing is, I, <clears throat> as we all know, if you read the, if you spend all your time on the internet, you're going to read so much shit you're not going to know any better it's just it's just diluted it's it's yeah. i'm not going to lie most of the stuff i write anymore are just microblogs it's just it's under 2200 characters it's short to the point it's not in depth at all it's not super training yeah 
but I do believe anybody that's coming in the industry, even though I've made many jokes about super training and being better used as a one board than an actual education tool, should go through and have the discipline to take as long as it takes to be able to get through the whole thing. If it's a year, one year, three years, yep. because it becomes their bullshit detector. Like I told JL when he was out here last week that anybody who's serious about this industry should be able to take you know any training methodology if it's 531 or ben pollock's think big or swede's fifth set or you know west side barbell and be able to say okay this is block this is conjugate this is linear this is hit they should be able to know what category or this is like a hybrid of these two but they don't because all they do is focus on, on these you know the actual programs yes but they don't focus on what those people like yourself have learned to be able to develop that program now if all they want to do is get strong just buy the fucking program i mean it's, it's not yeah, necessary yeah, yeah, yeah but if you want to be a coach and you want to be somebody that's going to really take their time to advance their career and their profession they need to be able to understand those building blocks because all you guys read all that stuff mastered all that stuff to be able to have that foundation that creates what you use to test yes with the athletes that you have yes yeah uh i don't have anything really to add to that i think that's <clears throat> uh, i think that's that, better than any exercise science degree bar yeah now. and it's like i i still go back uh I still think you can get your foot in the door in this in this industry without having a degree, and especially if you want to coach, like do what I'm doing or do. Oh yeah, that for sure. Like you're not going to learn how to coach or get any kind of contacts in a classroom. Like if you, I mean, I'm talking learn how to coach. Like hey guys, everyone sit the fuck down. We all, you know, and then commanding the room. You know how hard that is for some people. Uh, you know how many all those years we did seminars. You know what people. <clears throat> think about this when we were in high school or junior high when you're like listen you got a five minute speech you'd be like shit in your pants mm -hmm. and now it's like dude we got eight hours that's all we got fuck all right i guess we can cover the bench today yeah and uh you give people eight hours they're going to get up there and stumble around a little bit and uh i think that's a huge thing i wish i know we, we harped on that already in the beginning but no but every uh, time you step in to train those kids that foundation was laid stepping into a classroom teaching or giving a seminar yeah, or yeah. working with the kids in Kentucky. Yeah. But you, uh, I just think uh, <clears throat> there's more to coaching. And I, we said this before than just knowing how to program and, and uh, <clears throat> don't be so quick to think uh, you're not the reason why you fucking suck. <laughs> how about that? How about that? Take some fucking responsibility. And the other thing that says nothing to do with anything, but I live by this motto. It may not be your fault, but it's your responsibility. Oh, well, that's 100% true. You know, like, oh, so-and-so did this. I'm like, yeah, it sucks, dude, but you're going to have to deal with it, right? So let's fucking figure out how to deal with it. So. That's the mark of a business owner, a yeah. leader, a yeah. coach. You're never the reason why. You're never the success, <laughs> but you're always the reasons why yeah. something went wrong. So let's, yeah. And you have to assume that, you know, that just comes with the territory. And I, as being somebody that's fucked up a lot for 21 years, you get used to it. It's like, okay, yeah, my fault. You know, you're, well, it becomes easier to be like, yeah, I fucked up. The first yeah. couple of times, like, no, 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 no. You get a little defensive about it. Yeah. Like, hey, you know what? I, that was my fault. Yeah. You want to pass the blame. And then the more you do that, you know, if then you encourage the ability for your athletes or your employees to maybe reach out a little bit and try something that they might make a mistake on, but they're, they're cool with it because they know they're not going to yeah. get drilled because they made a mistake. That's a huge thing. Huge. I didn't even think about that. I admit I fuck up all the time with the kids. I'm like, listen, I screwed this. You got, we have to be going? No, you're good. I was just going to say, if you can rotate more. Oh, good, there we go. All right, what else you got? Uh, here's, there's a couple on this, actually. So there was a whole misconception with uh, Dave and Mark Rippletoe about uh, squat cues or whatever. What was misconceived? I was pretty clear no, about you that. You were clear. I'm saying that that was just something we talked about. Is there anything that you guys disagree on training-wise? Because you guys both train with Louie. So do you guys pretty much see everything the same, or is there anything that you guys see different? Uh, I would say I don't give a fuck how people squat. I don't because – He's focused more on powerlifters. You more on athletes. 
Yeah, well, you have to understand that uh, I learned something from Ethan Reeve. He's like, listen, I'm looking for about 80%, right? As long as they're not getting hurt and everything looks about how it should look, I'm happy, okay? Because the uh, purpose of the exercise is not to lift the most weight, right? At this point, the purpose is to train the legs, ass, whatever. Uh, the other thing is <clears throat> people that if I'm training, if me and Dave are training together, then we can perfect our squats, you're living in some fucking utopia, communist bullshit, socialist crap shoot if you think that one coach and 65 fucking kids, is, everything's going to be perfect, okay? That's just, it's not going to happen. So you look for a couple good things that you want to look for in the squat, back position, knee position, stance, whatever it may be. Uh, and some kids squat better, uh, higher bar, lower bar, hands wider. I don't care. If it gets the kid to squat correctly and he gets – without him getting hurt and he has the the things that you know we have kids box squat that can't squat you know why because it's not important that if he box squats or not i just want him to do something does that make sense to you dave yeah so i think when i i <clears throat> and plus some kids are taller some kids are shorter some kids feel more comfortable i don't care it doesn't bother me i'm never going to be tied down uh and lose my shit over something I can't control because the kid wants to put the bar a little lower, a little higher, I, or his stance might be a little bit different or something, or has to squat on a box or has to do this and that. I just don't care. It's neither. It's not. Uh, and I think you can't be. Now, if I had, it was me and thirty other coaches. Yeah, it's a little bit different. I think we could, you know, be a little better with it. Uh, but I, I, I don't. I, I just think that the. the the world is in such a disconnect between what you read on the internet and fucking reality. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I think that a couple things with this question is <clears throat> the context is not established. All right. I don't have the skill set to train the athletes he has. All right. Could I develop that? Yeah, but it would take time and I really don't want to. That's the key. I don't I don't I don't I don't, I don't have the patience. You know, I, I really don't. My skill set is actually working with <laughs> you know maybe a total of 2000 total lifters in the entire fucking country you know the the top top power lifters yeah. that i can find weak points on because that's just been the realm that i've lived in my entire life now with with that established i'm sure over the years there's been many conversations that we've had about training where we've disagreed on different situations or different modalities be it prowl or work for a football player, should they use a high handles, low handles, whatever mm -hmm. fucking point you want to make with it. And then I say, why? And then he'll give me the answer. I'll say, why? And he'll give me the answer. Then, oh, yeah, you're right. Or uh, th That's how the real world works. The real world doesn't work like somebody makes a fucking post on Facebook that says, pushing the prowler with a high pull or with a high handles is fucking worthless. And then 20 other coaches say, oh, you're bullshit, you're full of shit. If Jim's got a coach that he brings in as an assistant that's helping him during the summer for a camp, and the kid says, hey, I the, the high thing, that's the way to go, and Jim disagrees, he's going to say, you know what, I disagree. Kid's probably going to say, why do you disagree? Jim will say, well, the hip angle's not where it needs to be, or I don't like the shin angle, or whatever it is. Kid's going to say, oh, shit, never thought about that. Or vice versa, then Jim walks away learning. That's how the real world works. It's called, check this out, learning. <laughs> but that that's how real coaches communicate real coaches communicate like you see during our summit you know if jim's talking to buddy or milo or you know any of those people you know after they get through making fun of each other for not seeing each other for six or seven years i'm sure a question is going to pop up where they're going to say jim you know, what what have you what luck have you had with this scenario and then jim will put it out there and even if they think he's full of shit, they're not going to say, look, I think you're full of shit. They're going to listen to him. They're going to respect him. Then they're just going to go back and not use it. That's the real world. That's called, check this out, respect. You know, it's, it's a couple things that don't happen online. The, the thing I will say is, you know, I've done a number of seminars with Mark. I have never seen a coach get a person to squat faster, more correctly than him and i'm talking people like if you saw him dave you're like dude let's just trap bar <laughs> mm -hmm. you know yeah. like it, it, like it would, and within five minutes you're like gee like you turn around you're like man how did you fucking fix that so he's got 
however he does it, I'm not exactly, you know, he does cues and stuff. The way he's able to put people in position is unbelievable. Now, that doesn't mean how someone, if someone wants to squat a different way is wrong. He's just good at coaching what he believes, and he's able to do it. And mm. it doesn't, to me, I just don't, <clears throat> it, it's such a non-factor to me. It'd be like uh, someone, you have a white hat on, I have, like, was, was my black or gray mm. or something? Mm -hmm. And they, they're talking about it, like, I never even thought about asking Dave about his white hat. I didn't think yeah. I and think my takeaway with Mark was that um, he's been doing it for 30 years, so apparently he's doing something right. Yeah. You know, anybody that lasts for 30 years, like Ken Leisner, what is he now, like 98 years old? Yeah. Sorry, Ken. But don't tell me hit training doesn't fucking work. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the guy's still got athletes driving two hours to train with him, yeah. you know, in his freaking garage that he's making better over and over and over again. And he'll still have his critics the same way everybody else will. I, t you know, I, when I was at EFS, Dr. Ken would call and it was awesome. Cause he would tell me all these great old stories, just fantastic about the weeders, like shit that I never even knew. I was like, Oh my God. Cause he's come from New York mm -hmm. and he come from the, he's, you know, he was around before powerlifting ever started. And, uh, to make a long story short, uh, you know, he was, he's, he's gotta be in his seventies now. And, uh, he's like, I asked him something and he's like, listen, man, uh, someone's like, Hey, Dr. Ken, this guy was talking shit about you or something online. And he showed it to me and he goes, well, who is this guy? And he's like, I don't know. He's like, well, what, why are you showing me this? I don't fucking know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't even know who this is. Yeah. Why do you think I care? It was like a real genuine moment. He's like, I don't know what this fuck. Like, why should I care what he fucking thinks? And it was like a, like an old man moment. I'm like, eh. <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm all right with yeah. it. Yep. Uh, so I, uh, I try to drive the same point home in a different way where, you know, we could be how we can not even be doing this, but let's say somewhere in some school, there's somebody talking about five, three, one, you don't fucking know this is going on, but it's going on right now. And they fucking are bashing the shit yeah. out of it. You don't give two shits about it. Cause you're indifferent to it. Cause you don't even know what's going on. Here, here's yeah. That, not only that, but, uh, I have found, and this happens to be in life is the people who uh, scream the loudest and who are the lot, you know, just the most vocal uh, are the most unsure about what they believe in and who they are. Okay. So that's like a good litmus test. When you see someone yelling and screaming about something, whatever this is, I kind of feel bad for them. Like, man, you don't even believe in what you are and who, you, what you believe. Cause if you did, you'd just be like, you know what? I know I believe, I'm not saying that you're not right, but I believe in who I am and what I'm doing. And I'm okay with you not liking that because I know my shit works. And that's like, are you going to tell this London football, the shit doesn't work? You're going to tell, <laughs> you tell our opponents. Yeah. Huh? Tell the fans. Yeah. It's f fucking 50 points a game. And we, <laughs> most of our players didn't play past the second, uh, second quarter. If freshmen were out there in the second quarter. Freshmen. All right, let's see what we got, boys. <laughs> So, you know, sixth graders. Yeah. God. Well, I, I asked him, like, do you think they'd let us play with a less guy, one less guy, just to see what happened? Because I, I think we would, uh, and that's kind of a dickhead move, and that's more of a machismo thing. But, yeah. You know, I really believe in what I'm doing. I believe I'm helping people out, and I'm okay with, you know, people not agreeing with it. And I'm okay, you know. Doctor, but the Dr. Ken story, I'll never forget that because, uh, you know, I, I don't train like Dr. Ken trains, uh, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. And he's such a wealth of knowledge. If you actually sit down and talk, not just about sets and reps, because who cares about that shit? His, his uh, knowledge of the, the days of yore were, were just fascinating stuff. Telling me all about Lyle Azado. He's like, no one believes he died of fucking cancer. <laughs> Steroids did not cause his, it was just very funny. He's like, oh, come on. <laughs> People still believe that bullshit? It was just very funny. Uh, so, but... Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the more that you uh, are comfortable with yourself, the more you're able to be comfortable with criticism. And I can tell you right now, when, especially it's probably not so much me, but more so with Dave, when Dave, how much criticism did you and Louie receive? Oh, and times. you get upset because you wanted validation, but you know, maybe part of you, like, well, this is kind of new. And then after a while, you're like, you know what, I got an army full of dudes who are awesome. Eh, you know what? You can say whatever yeah, I, got, you want. I got way more upset about it than Louie because Louie was never online. And Louie's answer was always, well, who is he and what's he squat? Yeah. 
you know, he's got, where, the, he's got the Ken Leisner answer. Yeah. So footsie squat where it was a little bit different for me. Cause I had to learn how to, I had to learn how to control that, you know, and it's, I, I don't want people to think that, you know, all, all we're doing is giving advice is people are going to have a hard time with criticism for a while until you learn how to, to self-manage it. You can fake it, but it's still going to bother you. Yes. You know, but at a certain point in time, you're just going to realize it's not worth it because it's stealing from the rest of your life. Oh well, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, if I think I read something uh, Bruce Lee talked about, he was the greatest lesson you can learn is the self-control. Just sit back and take it in. Just look at it, you know, observe. And, uh, eh. you know, I, I don't agree with, uh, some of the stuff that some of the greatest minds, I'm like, you know what? I just don't see that. But you know, well, who am I to argue with their success? So, mm-hmm. eh, I don't. Dude, I'm my death, but I'm not going to give a shit what Boyd Epley or Louis Simmons thought of me. <laughs> no. <laughs> I just don't care. And there's no. two guys I hold in very high regard. Uh, I just, you know, so, I don't know. What else we got? Anything else? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> what, what were your top supplementary slash accessory movements <laughs> or exercises that would help uh, to build squat bench? Dave, what do you got, buddy? For the squat, we'll go squat first. Yeah, do squat and bench I assume for a power lifter, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, I hate questions like this because there's no, you know, yeah, there, there's no background. You know, the, I want to say, well, whatever your weak point is, but I don't know. You know, well, let's so, just let's just let's just say uh, uh, any multi-joint movement. You know, so if it's the squat. It's going to be any multi-joint movement that's going to help build the squat. So, let's just no. Let's just say this. Let's don't worry about the main exercise, whatever that would be. Yeah. Worry about all this second and third shit that you did. So don't worry about the safety squat bar, any of that. Just well, you got to. I mean, to me, it's still the posterior chain is huge. You you have to build the hamstrings, the glutes, and as far and the calves, as far as I'm concerned. So you're dealing with things like. You know, glued ham raises, stiff leg deadlifts, RDLs, uh, uh, dumbbell deadlifts. Good mornings. Good mornings. Louis inverse curl. Reverse you know, hyper. Reverse hyper. Anything that's going to pound the shit out of that because you can use lower loads, you know, to be able to bring up higher workloads, which is going to be easier to recover from. And it's also going to, for most people, it's going to be the stuff they're not going to want to do. Yes. So if you can prioritize that then they're going to be able to always get it done. And this is assuming that they're also taking care of, well, the lower back should be in there as well, but they're also taking care of, you know, dom- abdominal wall. And I, I hate to say core, but just the ability to absorb force, you know, the ability to brace and absorb force. The bench press, it's triceps, you know, it's, and the older I get and the more and more people I see get older with me, the shoulders get fucking destroyed on everybody so it goes back to something buddy morris told me fucking 30 years ago and i didn't listen and everybody else told, do, do the least amount of shoulder work you can possibly do to get the greatest result because you will pay for it in the end and when i look at the older lifters today what can they not do they can't chin they can't dip they can't do overhead presses so just by bro logic i kind of take those out of there but the triceps are definitely going to be what's going to drive a bench press assuming that the technique is locked in the lats are tight you know everything you you have the ability to drive the bar if you're just laying like a flat fucking marshmallow it doesn't matter how strong your arms are the deadlift is going to kind of correlate with the squat where if those muscles are built so will the deadlift there you go Any nutrition strategies you use or prefer when prepping for meat? Obviously, you're not competing anymore, but... No. <laughs> no. You <clears throat> don't cut weight unless you're setting a record. I, uh, just on a personal note, I am 44 years old now. It probably wasn't until I was 42 that I actually have to watch what I eat a little bit. It's the first time in my life I have to be cognizant of what I eat. Usually, I just, whatever 
I could eat whatever and nothing would happen. I mean, you know, within reason. So I just, uh, I had just right now, I, I mean, I'm not training for a meet now, so it doesn't really fucking matter. Uh, but everything I do training wise and diet wise and all that stuff is, is, uh, trying to maintain some sense of strength and my ability to do the things that I love with being healthy. That's it. So I really love squat, deadlift, bench, press, and stuff like that. So everything I do outside of that, diet-wise, conditioning-wise, assistance work-wise, is just I want to be able to do those things. And I, uh, I don't. I have certain goals, but I don't have like I don't want to squat 700 or anything like that. I'm just very happy to be able to do what I do. I wish you know, and by doing that, I'm able to do all the things I need to do. Uh, if that makes sense. So. Uh, I have been following a little bit of the uh, vertical diet by Stan Efferding and, uh, I don't do it a hundred percent because I still like to eat a little shit here and there. Uh, and it, <clears throat> you want to hear a fucking awesome story, Dave. So two years ago, I go in for my uh, annual checkup and you know how that shit goes. And I remember getting blood and I was like, God, I was so fucking pissed. I'm like, you know, only, I'm going to hear another lecture every year, the same fucking lecture. I've been dead for 15 years, Dave. <laughs> so I didn't think, you know, and so uh, then I get the call like, you know, a day later. She's like, listen, uh, your blood results are in. I'm like, all right, let me hear it. And she's like, everything looks perfect. And I was like, what? And I'm like, listen, I'm going to schedule me for an appointment. I want to come in. I need to see this because I think you're looking at the wrong blood. And, uh, so she's like, uh, all right, all right. So, and I, so I looked at all of it and we went over it and she's like, you know, your improvements are insane. My blood pressure was low. My cholesterol was sky high. Like everything was low triglycerides. And she's like, did you make any big changes? And I'm like, well, I walk all the time. I just started walking. I walked, uh, three miles every single day with a 25 pound weight vest, which is not that heavy. And I didn't walk hard. I just put some headphones in and did a stroll. So, uh, so that's about 20 miles a week or something like that. Right. Yeah. About 20 miles a week. And, uh, she's like, well, what about your diet? I'm like, oh, it's fucking worse than ever. And she's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I make like McDonald's twice a day. <laughs> like I just didn't care. And I was fatter than I've ever been. Like not bigger. Just I was like, I just mm-hmm. don't care anymore. Like my wife still has sex with me. I just don't care about anything. <laughs> right. I mean, it's like, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. yeah, I just don't care. I'm like, you know what? I'm still able to do some stuff. I'm, you know, and everything went down and, it was like this weird realization. I'm like, God, everyone's, and I felt great. I didn't look perfect. I was like, you know what? I could do anything I want. I sleep. I don't have sleep apnea. And just, you know, it was like, eh, I like reached this perfect point of nirvana where I was just like, eh, I can still bench this. I can still squat that. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, eh. But it was, she was so, she's like, so you're dying, huh? I'm like, nah, it's been <laughs> like t- two Big yeah. Macs a day. <laughs> I was all ashamed. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, every year, you know, well, that might have been three years ago. I just walk everywhere, and then I'd let that take care of my, uh, you know, it, it, it's funny because, you know, people talk about uh, conditioning stuff and all this, and I only do all that stuff to be healthy. I don't do it to lose fat because the only way to really lean out is to manipulate your diet mm-hmm. within reason. If you're older, I should say. If you're younger, it doesn't, you know. I don't know. I just, I think it's funny when, you know, walking around made the biggest fucking difference in my life well there's there's a few things it's circulation because it's i've been getting blood work done oh my god probably every other month for three years in some in some cases every month because you can now use direct labs so you can get it done yeah you know just straight out and not i'm not getting full panels every single time there's just certain things that i'm watching certain things that i'm trying to correct Certain things that will go off, certain things that won't. Hemoglobin's been a problem for me since I was 19. So it was a problem for my dad. It's pretty much always going to be a problem. So it's always high, but it's not like I'm going to stroke out high. The other things that would vary would be cholesterol here and there, you know, which I've had. Well, vitamin D was an issue, but that I can bring that up with supplementation and in the summertime, obviously, yeah, going yeah, yeah. outside. But uh, B is another one so there are you know phases of the year where i'll take injectable b12 i'll take b complex i'll take d you know just to be able to keep those things in line dhea would drop on me where i would bring that up um my testosterone is an issue 
Um, it's always been an issue, and I'm not saying you know it needs to be three thousand, yeah. but I mean an issue as far as if 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 I'm not on hormone replacement, it is flat out zero. So trying to keep it between five and eight hundred is the goal, and then if I try to push over that, sometimes other variables get skewed yep. because yep. of that. And but the biggest impact that I've had more so than uh, body weight, because uh, like you said, I I'm beyond giving a fuck what I really look like. I really don't care. I do I do want to get stronger. Um, cutting uh, this is going to sound fucked up, but cutting down the number of training days I do per week helped my blood profile oh, tremendously because yeah. there's less cortisol. Yep, I was there's less, less stress. stress. Yeah. So <sighs> stress is a component of blood work that everybody wants to talk about sleep. Everybody wants to talk about nutrition. But when you look at the leading, leading causes of death, stress is probably one of the top yep. pre-indicators of those causes of death. When you can control that and you can bring that down from a physical standpoint and emotional standpoint, because training is stress, you know, yes. depending upon how you train. I train like an idiot. So obviously it's going to be stress. Bringing that down has had the biggest impact of anything. Now, if I start training hard, because I do have strength goals that I like to try to obtain. When I push those is when I got to start watching the blood work, work a little bit more again, because the stress will start to go up a little bit. Uh, but even with that, it's never been, except for 15 years ago when Serrano wanted to kill me, it's never been off the chart, some major, major issue, just a lot of little ones that pop up that can be pre-indicators to things that could be bigger. The uh, I have two very, very hard training days a week. Like, <clears throat> they suck. Mm -hmm. Like I And I do that because I want to challenge myself. I'm not necessarily pushing tons of weight, but the reps and the volume is pretty fucking insane. But I can't do that three or four days a week. That's where the, taking a stroll. Yes. That's how you balance that stuff out. And then... Uh, See, we can roll that back then into the nutrition because I think we're looking at nutrition in a way backwards than what other people are. People that are asking the questions are looking at nutrition on how can that aid their training. We're looking at the nutrition of what does our training require yes. from the nutrition. <laughs> You know, because if, if I wanted to train harder, yeah, I would have to make adjustments to my nutrition, but I don't want to. Yeah. I'm you not, know? yeah, I'm not willing to, you know, here's, I remember someone asked me like, are you, would you ever do another meet? And my answer is no. And they asked why I said, dude, I'm not willing to do the things that I know I need to do. And that's all it comes down to. I'm not willing to, to train like that. I'm not willing to sacrifice my body. Dude, it sucks waking up hurting all the time. Mm -hmm. And I already do to a degree, but nothing like it used to be. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, is it worth benching 400 pounds again so I can't sleep? No, yes. fuck that. <laughs> no, it's nutrition does matter. I, I don't want to yeah. go up there. Like if when I was dieting and I was in calorie deficit, it matters tremendously. Most people's diet just flat out sucks. So when we're talking about a, a, a moderately poor diet, we're talking about fast food a couple times a week. Yes. You know, and the rest of it kind of being moderately normal human food. Um, some people are far so beyond that. Yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, that's. I have kind of one, one or two meals a week where you're like, dude, but everything else is pretty well within the normal range of everything, if that makes sense. Yeah, if I have any problem with my nutrition, it's not eating. Yeah, and it's not intentional. It's not like, oh, I'm fasting. It's like, no, I just forgot to yeah. eat for fucking yep. twelve hours. That's when you hit Popeyes. Yeah, do I love Popeyes? <laughs> oh, road trip, road. Uh, truck stop Popeyes, dude. That's when you need to hit a new low. It's right there, right by the uh, TSA that's, or whatever that's it's called. Low man, right there. It's fucking good, dude. That's they fucking know me there. I go oh there and they. God, what do you need? <laughs> Four piece. Yeah. I just need you to rotate your body, not the mic. There you go. Um, we got one or two more of you guys. Want yep, I got a pee pretty soon here. Okay. Um, we should have toilets installed. <laughs> a catheter. Ooh, you ever have one of those put no. in when you're awake? Not when I was awake. Oh, fuck that, dude. Fuck. Nope. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about catheters. Uh, why is programming more difficult for yourself than the people you train, or do you even agree with that? Uh, well, you're not very uh, sub you're not very objective with yourself, right? Uh, so and I. The question too, please. What's that? Oh, why is it? Why is tra programming for yourself generally more difficult than for other people? I I, th I think. 
for me, I think it's easier for me to program for myself uh, because I know what I feel like. I know what weights are supposed to feel like. I know what the goal is. When you talk to an athlete, a lot of times you're going to get a young athlete's not going to know what the fuck he's feeling, and then a very aggressive, awesome athlete is going to lie to you. Oh, I feel great. And you're like, dude, you know, that was bad. Uh, but I think you just, it's just hard to, uh, to be honest with yourself. That's the hardest thing, I think. Um, and it's hard to be – you talk about taking criticism. You generally don't criticize yourself, you know. So if you have someone on the outside – and it doesn't even have to be someone do all your whole program. It's just someone looking. It's like, dude, you really look like this right now. We need to, you need to do something about this. Um, I don't know. I, I also think it comes with, you know, I, I've been training my. I didn't have a trainer or a coach. You know, I had myself for all these years. So why would I want to? <clears throat> I've had all this experience. Tra- Does that make sense? Like I, I trust myself more than I trust anyone else, and. At this point in my life, training is more about uh, my time in my weight room, enjoying the thing that I love the most. I don't want some asshole coming in there. I won't let anyone train with me, you know, outside of like Matt Rhodes and Vincent and stuff like that. It's my time. So, but go ahead, Dave. I think if you're, if you are a coach or a trainer or a lifter training other people and you are not doing your own, programming then you have no business doing the programming for anybody else because the easiest person for you to be able to get feedback from is yourself you know how you feel you know how you feel when you wake up you know how you feel when you go to sleep you know how many hours of sleep that you get you know what you're eating you know how you're recovering the only obstacle that's in your way is what Jim spoke about your ability to be honest with yourself and if you can't be honest with yourself, then there's no way you're going to be honest with a client. Here, here's the thing. Let's say, like, I program safety squat bar squats, and, I, <clears throat> and you're like, ah, you know, uh, and you know for a fact, dude, that tr- it smokes my middle back. Like, if you don't know that from your own programming, then how would you know what the, kid, the kid's feeling? Mm-hmm. Uh, or when you do deadlifts, uh, way we, the way we, we do trap bar deadlifts a little bit different, that it smokes our grip. Well, you, if I didn't count for that, then you wouldn't know. If I didn't do it myself, I guess that's, yeah, that's a great way yeah. of putting and it. And the, the best way to learn is by doing. Yes. So, you know, in hindsight, I do agree with Jim that, you know, if you're a competitive lifter, you do want to have somebody on the outside looking in. You but know, it, it doesn't have to be everything. Though. It doesn't have to be everything, but it has to be enough because the higher up your ladder you get, the the more brain cells are going to die and the, and the more you're going to want to ram your head through the fucking wall harder than what you really need to, you need pulled back the higher you get the yeah. younger you are you need more kicked in the ass yeah the higher you are you need pulled back pulling yourself back is it's it's pretty hard especially after you miss a lift that you know you should have made you know i think vincent told a story of missing yeah, missing a max yeah. effort lift like 14 times until yeah. he got it you know, that would have been a case where it would have been nice if he would have called somebody on the phone or somebody would have said, you know, look, dude, <laughs> you know, after three, that's probably good. Yep. But overall, I think that, you know, they if that's the intention, if the intention is to never coach other people, then by all means, listen to somebody that knows what they're doing because they will know better than you. There you go. All right. Uh, on this one. All right. Favorite memory. Memorable things we've seen or just memory? You can take any, any route you want to go with it. Uh, Performance-wise, you know, there was Chuck's 1,000-pound squat that was done at the 2000 – Dave's meet, the, was the 2001 IPA Nationals. There was uh, that Russian lifter, the 165-pound guy, uh, Kucher, Alexander Kucher, who's the most impressive lifter I've ever seen in my entire life, ever. 165 squatted 900, benched close to six, and pulled eight at 165 with a loose fucking suit. That guy was a freak. Uh, and uh, so, like, that's like performance wise. And obviously, there's like <clears throat> the gym stuff. Um, I don't know, honestly, the, the my favorite memory is, you know, when I was in Kentucky, I was training in a one car garage. I was with two of my best friends, and it was like, you know, 
we didn't have a pot to piss in between any of us. Uh, just getting there for gas money was sometimes hard. And, uh, you know, we had some great, we didn't have a, you know, none of us had kids. We all have kids now. None of us are married. You know, we're all married now. All this shit was going down. It was just like, hey, you know, <clears throat> and I met Jason through you because you said he was, uh, went to a seminar and I always knew Kevin. And to me, that's the, that was kind of the, the time of my life where I didn't have anything and it was awesome. Now it's, you know, it's a different beast. So, yeah, dude, it's never, you know, the lifts are fine and everything. And, you know, I got to accomplish my goals, but I just, I look back now. It's like, eh, I'm happy. I got to spend it with my friends. So before Dave answers, you, saw, you mentioned that your biggest goal was at a thousand pound squat. Oh yeah. Were you, did you have total goals or was it? Did you, did you nah, I didn't care about a total. Who fuck? It's just powerlifting. <laughs> <laughs> Plus you have to understand things are, are, are Things have changed a lot, and Dave and I we always believed like the squat was like that was it, and you benched and like a six hundred pound bench eluded Dave, but uh, it's like eh, it was kind of cool. And then deadlift, no one cares about the deadlift, and uh, it's and so as someone who always loved the squat, and then teaming up with Dave who loved the squat, it was like eh, I could bench nothing and deadlift nothing. Like if you squatted eleven hundred, you didn't give a fuck. <laughs> Right, I would have loved to squat a lot hundred though. <laughs> but I'm just Fucking saying, like, that, awesome. that's the best lift. It, it, yeah, the squat in terms of lifting is the only, and I don't really count the bench as a lift. So let's just say the deadlift. You can, if you miss the deadlift, you just drop the bar. The squat, there's consequ there's consequences. Whether you're doing a one rep max or a twenty rep max, there's fucking consequences. And I think that's why the squat has is the biggest, you know, <clears throat> testicle builder in training. And yeah, nothing uh, can be weak on the squat. No. And I don't care, you know, I use the safety squat bar, you use the spider bar, which is essentially the same thing. Like it's it'll start fucking folding you, man. And you start seeing things, man, it's like a it's a it's a builder. And I you know, I still deadlift and everything, but like I said, like you just you know, once you get tired, just you know, nothing works, the bar just falls down. <laughs> you don't get that uh you don't get that luxury with the squat. There's a lot of lifts, you know, it's like I mentioned Goggins and I'll, I just kind of leave that as what it is. Andy Bolton pulling a thousand. I could yeah. go, I can go on and on and on, but there's also a lot of times that I've been to a meet that you see, you know, some old dude, you know, who's like 85 years old, Kick you know, ass. pull 315 and take 12 minutes to stand up with it, yep. which is just as memorable as some of the other stuff. When I think back and try to pinpoint, I just spent this whole last time trying to think of what what are my greatest memories of the sport. It's kind of fucked up because I was in it from 83 to 2005, and there's not one that just stands out as being, you know, that this was a great memory. It was just the whole thing was, um, it was my life. It was my identity. You know, that would be like saying what was, you know, the best thing in your life, but yet, you know, I, I can point that out, you know, getting married, having kids, you know, but no lift was ever that important because there was always a bigger one to come. You know, that would like be saying, you know, getting married, this wife isn't important because the next one's going to be better than this, yep. you know? So it's, you know, it, it all mattered, you know, it was all, it, it all mattered. It was all important because it was such a big part of my life that when I know when I am on my deathbed and when I do die, I will think about powerlifting. I know I will. You know, I will think about my kids. I will think about my wife. I'll make sure that they're okay. But I will think about training and I will think about powerlifting. You know, I know I will. You know, I've been in the position. I know I will. It's not going to occupy every thought, you know, that goes in my head. But it was that much to me. It mattered that much to me that at this stage of my life, I only hope that I can find something else to be able to add to that those thoughts that I'm going to have you know so it is more than just my wife my kids and doing squats and squatting yeah. awesome. you guys want to wrap it there then? yep yeah thank you for joining us I gotta piss holy cow <laughs>